Okay, Teresa, I believe we're ready to go. Okay, I will call to order the May 18th, 2020 regular meeting for the Tip City Board of Education, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America, America. And, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Ready for roll call, Dave? This is Dun Mrs. Dunaway. Here. Mrs. Dahl. Here. Mrs. Heatherly. Here. Mr. Patry. Here. Mrs. Accor. Here. All present and accounted for this evening, Madam President, we have a quorum tonight. Okay, thank you. So we will start with the superintendent and assistant superintendent's report. And item A is graduation, and I believe that's you, Dr. Kumpf. Thank you. Uh, so for graduation, just wanted to once again uh, congratulate our seniors that uh, uh, are going to be, many of them, walking across the stage and receiving their diploma here either on the 20th, the 21st, or 22nd at the high school uh, with a single family presentation, diploma presentation. Uh, they will receive a graduate box that day as well with special certificates and other items in that. Uh, but we will have a virtual graduation that will be on May the 30th at 7 p.m. and hope that everyone really enjoys that and finds that to be a good connecting time for their families and uh, also with their classmates as they, they watch this graduation virtually. Uh, I want to thank our administration. I want to thank our counselors, our teacher, teachers, and our classified staff and our board for trying to put all efforts forward to make this as special as we can, knowing that it is a, a difficult and unprecedented time, but trying to make the best of that and making our graduates feel special. So any questions on that? I, I have a question. Sure. Um, the, uh, I was asked to, as you know, to, to participate in the graduation, but it's my understanding that some families may want additional family members there, would it be useful for us board members to, to bow when, if, if requested so they can add another family member? Well, uh, that's a, a wonderful consideration, but I'll have to say is that uh, we do have a schedule and we have a plan that has been put in place and approved by the health department. Uh, what we did do uh, was we took an extra step to accommodate larger families. And so there is what we call a viewing area uh, and so we do have those that are able to be in the gymnasium and then just outside the doorway and we actually move the stage up more than halfway toward where those uh, hallway doors are. So they will be able to have a viewing area there and then as they just proceed out to the next door they could join their family for a joint uh, photograph as a whole family. So I, I appreciate your effort, but uh, we also got thinking about the time frame. It literally takes us over two days to do this with the sequence that by getting up and, and changing people in and out, that um, it's just very difficult to schedule all those things. But ultimately we want families you know, to feel a celebration and graduates as well. And so we have taken this extra step. I hope that we have accommodated absolutely as many families as possible by making this adjustment with the viewing area. Good job, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Cohn, I, sorry, it's loud at my house. I, uh, I just wanna say that I'm super proud. I know that all of the hours that, you know, that you and your team spent working on this and there was, originally it was four family members and we really tried to do our best to accommodate everybody with staying in the health department codes. And I just thought it was, you know, a wonderful suggestion to do the, the half court and have the additional family members. I just, I, I just, I hope that all the families appreciate that we were really making every effort possible to accommodate as many family members as, as we, as we can. Thank you. And I, I hope our, our families feel supported. I do Do Dr. Kump, can I ask you a question in normal graduation circumstances? How many invitations go out to the graduate's family, typically? All right, I'll ask Mr. Vierhoff on that because he's closest to that. Mm -hmm. In the past, we, we've allowed um, eight tickets and then that can fluctuate based on the need. 
Um, mm -hmm. I have some students who only need three or four tickets and another that may need a dozen. So we'll, we'll shift things around and try and make things work as best we can. But you're exactly right, Mrs. Gore. There is a limit each year on the number mm -hmm. of tickets and, and people that family members or family members that are permitted to attend. So, um, and so this is really not that far off. I mean, we're allowing, if I understand correctly, it's seven plus the graduate. Is that right? Right. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. Okay. And so I just want to say thank you very much to um, our superintendent, Dr. Kump. I want to thank you, Mr. Verhoff, and all the staff, the high school. I mean, this has just been so monumental and layered. And it's obviously that we're not going to have 100%, 100% of the people, 100% pleased because it's COVID-19. But I appreciate the fact that you've put together a plan. You're working so hard to make it as special as you can. And I just want to remind the public that this is Dr. Kump's last graduating ceremony as well, and okay. certainly not the way she expected or wanted it to end. So thank you very much for your efforts. Mr. Vierhoff, are you ready for distance learning? Yeah, um, before that, I think we also need to make sure we recognize Mr. Chris Zink and, and Ms. Leslie yes. Cristofano. They've, they've put in a ton of hours and, and, and work towards making this the, the very best um, scenario for students and, and several staff members as well. So the high school has done a great job with this. Thank you. So shifting gears here to distance learning, um, obviously the board's aware that new instruction ended last Friday. Um, parents, uh, students are still able to uh, work with teachers to still complete assignments and revisions and retakes up until the last day of, of the school year. Um, but we're closing out the school year with eyes ahead on 2021. Uh, we're working on curriculum, curriculum mapping and gap analysis with our teachers. We've got meetings set up this week to identify content that needs to be front loaded in, in the beginning of next school year. We're also doing professional development related to distance learning um, and, and looking at what the fall could, could look like. Uh, this professional development is virtual and self-paced. Uh, and it focuses on Google Classroom, Edpuzzle, uh, and Screencastify, all areas of instruction and tools that we think will help teachers going forward. Uh, all teachers will earn certifications in those, those programs. Um, prep is going on behind the scenes for 2021. Uh, we've been meeting since late April to talk about the, the plans for, for what the fall could look like. Um, that has included Mr. Stefanik at times so that he's involved and aware and, and contributing to what those plans could look like. Uh, we've been looking at blended learning models, the school calendar, facility preparations, transportation, staffing, food service, and then instructional and technology needs. Um, we're not, <laughs> we're not going to sit on our hands and wait for scenarios to come to us. We're trying to be proactive and, and, it is a little bit of a guessing game. And I guess that's where we all come into play here and advocating for the state school board, the state superintendent, state legislatures to make some decisions on what next fall could be looking like. Um, so I guess that, that would be my call to the board. If, if they're able to reach out to those um, groups, that would be extremely helpful to us. We're doing that with our professional organizations as well. Any questions with distance learning? Did you ever have your meetings with your parent focus groups? We did, yes. We had two of those. Um, they were very successful, and that's a group that I think we'll continue to come back to throughout the summer to bounce ideas and, and share tentative plans and, and get feedback from them on what that would look like from a parent's perspective. How did you pick the parents that were in those focus groups? We had approximately 40 parents who responded in the survey that they wanted further contact. And so we reached out to those 40 parents and offered them the opportunity to sit in on that. Great. I, I just want to say that your efforts were nothing short of heroic that you guys have accomplished. Um, really great job. Yeah, it's very proactive, Steve. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, move on to citizen comments. Corinne, do you want to start with citizen comments or do you want me to go? Oh, I think she's on mute. I'm, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to start? I, um, whatever you want to do. I, okay. I, okay. So do you want me to read? Well, hang on, Dave, are you going to start the timer? Because we have so many, if we go over the 15 minutes, then do we want to do 15 minutes at the end? What do you think? You're, you're muted, Dave. Mute, muted. <laughs> I know it's, it's so good to show the Zoom stuff. I will start the timer, um, but I believe based on what I've seen in the comments, we should be able to get through them. But okay. I'll start. Okay, so you just let us know if we need to stop and we'll do them at the end. Okay, so go ahead, you start free and then I'll finish, whatever, whoever you have. Okay, um, the first one I have tonight is Leslie Hellman. Uh, says, I would like to address the board's discussion and decision regarding open enrollment as it relates to the budget. During the state of the school district presented by Dr. Kumpf, I brought up the impact of budget on Tip City Schools in response to the economic impact of COVID-19. Dr. Kumpf made it clear at this time the district is not planning any reductions in staff programs or change in budget projections other districts in the area and across the state are preparing for potential reductions in funding and some are beginning plans for budget reductions for next year although tip a district that does not rely on income tax but rather property tax may feel that that is an appropriate reactive position, I would suggest the board, the treasurer, Dr. Kump and Mr. Stefanik reconsider funding sources that would allow for a proactive position. The purpose of my citizen comment is to ask the board to, cons to reconsider any major decisions that could negatively impact the district budget for the 2020-2021 school year. As we sit and wait to see what the state will do with funding, we continue to hope that property taxes will hold and be collected. We must be proactive to fund our district with available monies, and in this instance, the turning away of funding from open enrollment open enrollment seems financially negligent. The next one is um, from Dana Martin. I am assuming you are seeking community input for the board meeting this evening. Typically, I don't often speak up as I felt that the school district does pretty well. This time, however, we have failed our kids. This is not entirely all the school district, but the state as well. We need you to do better for our children. The current plan proposed is not a viable solution. Most parents in the school district are not teachers, and it is absolutely unrealistic to expect that they should step into that role. Many parents have to work to find ways to provide for their families in a struggling economy. How are they to teach as well? Most of the online schooling completed during this last quarter is complete garbage. I can tell you that my fifth grader did not benefit at all. The one exception is in Algebra 9, which my older daughter took this year. This class was specifically designed to be self-directed with teacher input and assistance. No other classes were designed this way, so they are failing. This is not the fault of the teachers, but of the circumstances they were put in with no plan put into place to help the, to help, to help the ad address. Aside from all that, kids need teachers. They need interaction. We live in a highly technical society. Kids already suffer from underdeveloped social skills. This is only making it worse. They need to go back to school. Thank you, Dana Martin. So my first one is from Kathy Bone. And oh, I, I have, do you want me to wait to read one more? Um, go ahead. It says, um, good evening. I am writing in regards to the agenda item, distance learning. First, thank you to Mr. Vierhoff and his IT counterpart for hosting the two focus groups. This evening's group represented a variety of grades. As parents, we were given ample time to provide feedback and answer questions. Thank you for the opportunity for our voices to be heard. The most poignant moment, in my opinion, was when each parent opened up about how distance learning has affected their child's social and emotional well-being. Whether through epic meltdowns, one-on-one -on -one conversations with parents, or through slight mood changes, each child expressed how this has impacted them. As a person who works with a variety of students across numerous districts, this is not just a tip city concern. From my experience over these past weeks, 
Students have felt the impact of their parents not being able to assist them with schoolwork, parents being unable to collect unemployment in a reasonable amount of time, parents being sent to rehab, parents sitting outside subway trying to get internet access, or parents working extended hours and not at home as often. As school resumes in the fall, I hope the district keeps students' overall well-being in mind. Returning to school or not coming into school for the first time, like our kindergarten gardeners, will be an adjustment. Please return to our school's guidance. Please turn to our school's guidance counselors as they are vital resources to our students and in turn become a vital resource to us as parents. I want to thank them for all they do for our children. Thank you for your time and consideration, Lauren Gibbs. And that's it, Teresa. Okay, great. So my first one was Kathy Bone. So it says you may, oh, hang on. She sent like a, a, a list of questions and then she added on to it. So I'll just start. Kathy Bone had a series of questions. One, will the Department of Education require more distancing in the classroom of students? This could really be a great avenue to continue the push for a closed door policy. Two, since we have already been told we have more room than necessary in high school, should we put another grade up there for spacing kids out? Three, will we need to disconnect water fountains in schools and reconnect maybe a water refilling station for refilling of each student's own private water bottle that they must bring with them from home? Four, will we need to have two shifts at school? They do that in Spain around siesta time. Five, will we need to use the auditoriums more as a lecture hall for kids to space them out as well? Six, will the dress code include at least a homemade cloth mask on all students? Don't forget to include the wording of no vulgarity on masks. Seven, will the bus drivers be asked to sanitize the bus after each route? Eight, will all classrooms need sanitized at the end of each day? Nine, will classrooms move in a more strict timeline as far as switching from one classroom to another? So maybe not so many kids are in the hallways at the same time. Ten, for those teachers who found it difficult to do online school, will there Will there be any help and assistance for them to build a better online classroom for the next time this may come around? 11, college courses are taught online all the time. Maybe some of the teachers could benefit from seeing how those are set up for not only the learning aspect, but also the test taking. 12, will temperatures need taken for staff and kids? If yes, by whom? an aide on the bus before they get on, or someone at the school for the walkers and drivers. 13, is the school year going to have to be longer to accommodate the number of instruction hours if class days are split? Should the school board look into less days off during the school year, such as winter and spring break, to make up for lost hours instead of making the school year longer? 14, will some programs by the school have to be adjusted or totally gotten rid of. You all know me and I could go on and on, but I think you get the idea that we need to look forward to what a reopening may look like. While I don't personally agree with everything the state is doing regarding COVID-19, especially the tracking of cases and shutting most things down, I believe they will only complicate the issues the schools may already have. So with that in mind, I think the school board should sit back and look at the what ifs in this letter and think about how we as a district may need to come up with a plan before the state throws some stuff at us. Maybe if we think about this now, when they send their information on reopening, we can be ahead with a little plan of action ourselves. Kathy Bone. So the next one is Rachel Cartwright. My two children will not be attending in the fall if masks, social distancing, conditioning, excessive toxic cleaning chemical use, mixed school days, corona assignments are given, et cetera, are implemented. We will without a doubt homeschool with our own chosen curriculum. As for voting on cutting Sylvia Elridge's position as support staff, she is without a doubt an essential employee. She is a huge asset to the school district, especially considering the fact that she's bilingual. 
I think you underestimate the number of students that will be pulled from the district in favor of homeschool. Thank you, Rachel Cartwright. My final one. Dear Board of Education, I am writing today to express my concern that TIP is considering letting go one of the most talented, positive, and enthusiastic individuals I know. I run a business and understand how hard it is to find a person like Sean Ford. Sean checks all of the boxes that will keep Tip City Schools ahead of the curve. Please do not make the mistake of letting him go. Sincerely, Barry Willoughby. That's it. Teresa, I did have one more person who did confirm their- Did I miss that? No, no, you didn't miss it. it okay. They did confirm as we started the meeting. So let me pull that one up very quickly. You want to just go ahead and read it because I've got two laptops open, but I can't click yeah. on my, okay. I will go ahead and read it. Um, so this is from Julie Willoughby. Dear Board of Education, I am writing to express my shock and disappointment to see so many wonderful teachers with contracts looking to not be renewed. I have known Sean Ford since he was a young student at Tip City Schools and I have the utmost respect for him. He is a huge role model for the middle school students and was an, ex and was an excellent football coach to my son. I have also had nothing but positive interaction with Kyle Corbin. My graduating senior had him as a football coach for several years and was a huge role, mo role model and positive support to all the kids. It will be devastating to lose such valuable assets for our kids in schools. Please reconsider renewing their contracts. We need more individuals who take such pride in their students and care about them both in and out of the classroom. Sincerely, Julie Willoughby. That's all I have. Okay, great. So that takes us to TCEA comments. And tonight, the TCEA representative is going to be Mr. Randy Sutton. I don't believe I have Mr. Sutton in the waiting room. Oh, shoot. We sent him the link. Oh, darn it. I feel bad now. Well, let me email Mr. Sentman. Uh, we'll move on with the meeting. And if he okay. jumps on, then we'll, we'll get him in. Okay. All right. So then we will move on to president comments. And I know what the topic of Mr. Sentman's comments are going to be. So I, I don't want to steal his thunder. He's going to. So... I, I will have no president comments at this time because it's going to be the same as Mr. Simmons. So that moves us to approval of minutes. I was not able to get that email out in time. Steve, would you be able to try to reach out to Mr. Sentman through email and see if we can get him in here? Yeah, I've already done so. Okay, great. Okay. All right, approval. Just let us know when he chimes in, Dave, and we can get back over to his, he's gonna that sounds, that make sounds a great. address. Okay, so I am looking for approval of the meeting minutes from the following meetings. We have the March 31st, 2020 special meeting, the March 31st, 2020 work session, the April 9th, 2020 special meeting, the April 21st, 2020 work session, the April 27th, 2020 regular meeting, and the May 4th, 2019 work session. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion and second by Dunaway and Dahl. Hey, Joellen, you're on mute. I know, I, thank you, it's mm -hmm. fine. Any comments, any corrections? I did not receive anything from anyone. So I know that there was a lot to go through. You did a great job. I don't like the format, they were nice. I didn't find anything. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed, I did try to not do word for word. Yes, um, it's a lot better. I tried to cut back uh, just because I, you know, somebody had mentioned contacting the city, Tip City, to see how they do their minutes. Uh, they currently don't have a transcription service or a machine or anything. Uh, the clerk of courts, not the clerk, no. the council clerk, she is the one that takes care of those. She goes and li listens to them like I do. Uh, she also indicated that she is also part of a national clerks association. And when they discuss meaning and, and records like that, they say do not do word for word. So we're going to try to cut back on those and just put in 
as much meat and potatoes as I can without having this, the desserts and, and the salads and things. So, all right. Um, so if there's no other comments, um, I'd like to go ahead and just do a vote on that. Uh, Dunaway? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Featherly? Yes. Patry? He's muted, I'm waiting. Simon? Simon, you're on mute. Do you want to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Uh, there you go. Abstain for not having been at the April 9th meeting. Okay. And then uh, Mrs. Zakor. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Okay. The next item from the treasurer, uh, looking to get an approval of the monthly financial report for April 2020. I'll move. Thank you, Corinne. I'll, I'll second. second. Mrs. I'll Dunham. second. Oh, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Heatherly. Okay. Go ahead, Dahl and Heatherly. Ready? Any discussion? Oh, let me see, anything interesting? Uh, just. Um, I, I know I mentioned this a, a lot. Uh, interest again has taken another plummet from what we saw in April. So we're now we're even lower in March. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. From March is uh, even lower in April for that. Um, so other, other than again, though, we're pretty consistent. Um, the the COVID-19 effects on expenditures not quite hit us yet in in April. Um, because we're paying for the things that happened in March. Uh, just the uh, purchase services are lower than where they would have been if things had been normal and that's because of utilities and such. So that's all I have there. Does anybody have any other questions for me that I can discuss with them? Do you think there's gonna be an adjustment to the ESC bill? You know, I, we, we increase money and I don't know how much we're using their services. In well, the last few weeks. I will have to follow up with the ESC on that. Uh, Greta, do you know anything with that? Uh, the only reason I ask is because everyone is, I don't know if the ORC when it comes to continuing payments for employees is still required uh, for the ESC as well. And I would just interject that uh, ultimately uh, much of our services are connected to uh, special ed and support services, and those are continuing to be conducted. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually, as a state, provided the provision that therapies and things of that nature could be provided uh, via remote. And so it's, it's done differently, and that was a, a learning curve for them as well, but I have heard it's being successful. Okay. Thank you but it won't hurt for me to contact them and ask about it. Right. Anything else? Uh, one second, Dave. I'm trying to find something. Sure. Oh. This is the five year? Not yet. Yeah, we're not on the five years. Not yet, Ann. Okay, I'm sorry. But all right. I'll hold that for later. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and take the vote. And once we do this, we'll go back and I will, uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Sentman for his comments because he is now in the waiting room. Anything else? I'm sorry, I might have cut somebody off. I don't think there was any comments. Okay. Uh, Dahl? Yes. Heatherly? Yes. Dunaway? Yes. Battery? Same. Zakor? Yes. Okay. We'll go back up to the EA comments. Randy, are you, are you there? Can you hear me? We sure can. All right. Uh, I was, I don't know what happened. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, on behalf of Tip City Education Association, we extend congratulations to the Tippecanoe New High School class of 2020. Your determination in these unprecedented times will aid you as you continue on your journey after high school. 
TCEA knows you will do great things as you venture into the world. Additionally, Tip City Education Association would like to take this moment to acknowledge all students as we forged ahead to work and learn, traveling a new path of distance learning. Finally, TCEA would like to thank all certified and classified staff, administration, board members, and parents for their resourcefulness and support to every student who calls Tip City Schools home. Tip City Education Association wishes everyone a successful end of the school year and a relaxing and healthy summer. Thank you for giving us this time to talk. I apologize it took me so long to get here, so. Thank you, Mr. Setman. Okay, Dave, back to the treasurer's report. You wanna do your president's comments now, Teresa? Oh. Well, no, my, I just wanted to thank, thank the graduating class of 2020, and I knew Mr. Simpson was going to do the same thing, so I didn't want to be redundant. So congratulations to our graduates, and I'm sure nobody could have ever anticipated, um, you know, what we would have all been going through with, with this pandemic. So that, that's my comment. Okay. All right, thank you. Then we will jump back to the item C, the treasurer's report. The Ohio Revised Code 570541 Purchase Order Certification, then and now, this year 2020 for April 2020. Can I get a motion to, to approve? I'll make the motion. Can I get a second? I'll second. Motion and second. Dunaway, have we? You said we're on item C, Dave. Yeah, that was item C of the mm -hmm. treasurer's contract or the treasurer's. Okay. We're on item B, appropriation amendments. We are. I'll just do this one first, item C, and then we'll do B in a moment. Okay. Okay. Forgive me for jumping ahead there. Okay, so we have a first and a second for the ORC. Uh, purchase order certification. There's, we, there is one item on the list, and this was just for the ESC of Northeast Ohio. Any questions on this bill? Quiet. My dog's going to bark. We have neighbors. <laughs> Okay, I'll go ahead and call roll for a vote. Uh, Dunaway? Yes. Netherly? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Patry? Yes. Before? Yes. Okay. Now, item B uh, approval of the fiscal year 2020 appropriation amendments. Can I get a motion? I'll make the motion. And a second. I'll second. So done away doll, Dave. Okay. Um, if Any you'll notice, comments? Yeah, uh, just there, the only items really here were the appropriation changes that were done by Meta that, to create, to fix an issue that occurred when we transitioned from the old state software to the new state software. So there was nothing for the district changing anything. However, I did want to note that I did make a couple of revenue changes and you'll notice that that big one is in the state budget cut, uh, $536,228. That's because the, the states announced the changes to the foundation revenue for schools and that's our reduction. So we needed to put that into our financials. And then we did also receive a couple donations for a scholarship. That's it for me. Any other comments? Uh, quick question, Dave, on this the open enrollment funding, did we already receive the funding for this on this one and it doesn't get adjusted or? The, the, the open enrollment funding is just for this fiscal year. So we won't see any reductions to that until the next school year. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we're ready for a vote, Dave. All righty, Dunaway? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Heatherly? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Four. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. All right, item D of the treasurer's report. Uh, we're looking for approval of the following transfer. 
This is $300,000 from the general fund to the general fund 9004 social studies curriculum account. And again, this is to fund the social studies curriculum for the 2021 through 2026 school years. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion and second, Donna Ward Kelly. Does anybody have any comments? Ready for a vote, Dave? Dunaway? Yes. Heatherly? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Patry? Yes. Before? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay. Treasurer's report item E approval of the updated 2020 five year forecast. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion. And a second? I'll second. Thank you, Corinne. Motion and second, Heavenly Dahl. All right. Go ahead, Dave. You can. St this was a lot of information. It is. It is. And I appreciate all of your breakdowns because it was it was overwhelming. Uh, the good thing is the five the five year forecast. Uh, luckily, is a it's a living breathing document. It changes every six months, and and overall, what everyone needs to remember is it is just it's just a a guess. It's. Um, I wish we all had a crystal ball so we could look ahead into the future to see what's going to happen. Unfortunately, this year really had a curveball with the COVID-19 issue and with the state handing down changes in budgets as, as late as May 7th, you know, I mean, here we are looking to approve this and on May 18th and we're changing tons of things on this. Uh, I feel right. there are school districts that approve the forecast in April. You know, just so they can get a, a jump on it and, and just think of all the things that had to change. Um, the, the best page to look at would be page two in the assumptions where it discusses the changes from what we had back in our November of 2019 five-year forecast versus what we're seeing now in May of 2020. Um, so this talks about um, we've included to 2020 financial activity that we've seen. Our property tax revenues were higher than what we had anticipated in, in November. Um, the changes to the state aid due to the, redu due to the reductions from the Ohio Department of Budget and Management, we, that $532,000 I mentioned a little bit ago to our revenues. You know, there's nothing worse than being told in May of a fiscal year that, I'm sorry, we have to cut your budget 500 grand. Um, but we did put that into the forecast. Casino revenues are, are down. Tax revenue estimates, uh, currently we've been able to update that with the Miami County Auditor's latest updates. Um, we have included some salary staffing changes, uh, such as we are doing some attrition. So we've removed some positions that we're just going to lose through attrition. And we've... Uh, we had to bump up our contracted services for the changes we had for the ESC charges. So, I mean, there's been a lot of changes from, from November to now. And, and unfortunately, while this forecast goes out five, five years, you know, this year plus four more, we have to change it again in November because these numbers right here, we're gonna know better information. Shoot, we could know better information next week than what we've yeah. got right now, so. It's a moving target. Uh, I, I feel confident though that from, from who I've spoken with and who I've uh, looked for for guidance on determining what the state is doing, I, the treasurers have been meeting on a weekly basis. And uh, I feel pretty confident with the numbers that we have in this forecast. Uh, looking forward to see how well we come to hitting these numbers when we know more. But uh, other than that, I'd like to present this to the board for their approval. Any questions? Um, I have a, did, go ahead. Uh, well, um, are, are we getting, well, what are we getting for the CARES Act? So the CARES Act has currently been estimated to be 80% of the Title I funding that we were, uh, that we received in fiscal year 2020. 
So that's about 140 to 145 thousand um, dollars. The CARES Act money, I believe, it will be deposited into a fund 507. That'll be a new fund that we haven't used before, to, so that we can keep track of these expenditures. And do we so, have to spend it on certain things since it's title money? Well, it, it's um, it's federal money. It's not that it's title money. It's it's federal money. They just use the Title I allocation on how oh, they okay. gave it to everyone. So we are allowed to spend it on any type of federal expense that we would normally have right now across any of our consolidated federal grants. That's Title I, Special Education, Title IV, Title IIA. And they've also added that we can use this money to help cover expenditures that we have incurred for COVID-19 issues. Mm -hmm. And we can also use it for equipment and supplies for COVID-19. Uh, one of the things that we're looking for uh, is um, purchasing additional Chromebooks if this distance learning continues uh, because we're anticipating having to buy more than what we're normally used to purchasing. So we can use some of that money for those Chromebook purchases. Thank you. So Mrs. Dahl, just as you're so familiar that often with state dollars that they do have uh, a configuration or guidelines that we have to fit in. So uh, as, as Mr. Stevenson was saying that it does have some additional things that we don't usually have coverage for, but then there are those other pieces that we always have to look at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey Dave, did we hand out about 125 Chromebooks for the distance learning? That I do not know. I do. Okay. Know I thought that was that was pretty good. That's a low number. Right. I think that was our initial number, and then okay. as we saw, some of that did grow, and we we responded to that. But uh, we are really feeling a need to boost up to get ready for the next round, uh, mm -hmm. should that occur. Okay. This is done away. It was a little over 200 devices that we oh, loaned okay. out. Um, what we did find was that a number of students uh, were sharing devices at home. And that's something if we get into a blended learning situation in the fall, um, we're going to need to have more devices on hand to, to be not one to one, but as close to one to one as we can get. Absolutely. Thank you. I believe that Mr. Sagona. You know, I, I know, I know that Mr. Sagona has received a quote for 600 Chromebooks. Wow. And this, will, this will help replace aging Chromebooks that we were looking to replace anyway, and then additional Chromebooks to help fill the gaps that we're seeing for the families. So. Mr. Patrick, I believe you had a question. I had a few, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm looking, I, I believe that the, the state funds are reflected on, on line 1.035 of page one where you're looking at actual versus forecasted, is that correct? That is correct. And so I'm seeing for 2020, we're expecting about $520,000 in revenue reductions. And then for 2021, I guess, do you guys have a feel that we're gonna get about 824,000 reduced from that state funding? Uh, we do, we're estimating a 10% decrease currently in state funds from this year to next year. 10% uh, is a lot. But because we don't have any guidance from the state yet on what they're doing to help fill their loss from property tax and income and state sales taxes and things, uh, you know, I'd rather put in a budget of 10%, have a 5% cut and find out that we're better. And I'd rather use 10% than 5%. And here we're going to get a 15% cut. So 10% was the number that, that treasurers are, are, were feeling that that's pretty confident because uh, again, this is a guessing game. Um, I do know that uh, I was working with K-12 consulting with this as well. And they were going back to 2008 when we had that great depression occur there and they were trying to, now this isn't the same situation, but we're seeing the same uh, problems with people not having jobs and losing their jobs. So, so you're gonna have tax revenue not coming in and uh, income tax is not coming in. So they were trying to mirror and see what happened then, what can we estimate is gonna happen now? So 10% is where we came up with. Makes sense. Uh, on the, I think the open enrollment revenues reflected on 1.060, is that right? It is, that is correct. So then from 2019 to 2020, we had a pretty 
good reduction in that line. Was that all, was that reduced open enrollment like just naturally or what was the No, no, there was an open enrollment decrease of $100,000 from 19 to 20. So that's gonna be part of that. Um, I'd have to dig in again and see where those numbers are for the remaining reductions. Oh, 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 um, we also had some, if I'm not mistaken, we had a, a uh, board of revision adjustment that was done for some property. So we ended up having 75 to $80,000 of additional funds that were turned in last year that go in that line item. Um, so I can, if you'd like, I can get you more additional information on that to break down exactly what happened. And the, why would I just, cause wouldn't that be in the property taxes being reduced? Well, or it's, it's payment in lieu of, it's a payment in lieu of property taxes um, that we received on that because it was a uh, wasn't property taxes, but it was a settlement. I'm with you. And then on um, on twenty twenty one, the difference from of about five hundred forty eight thousand nine hundred forty five dollars. How much of that is open enrollment, and how much is the reduction in revenue relate to something else? Well, the open enrollment number hasn't changed. It's still the three hundred ninety something thousand dollars that we've had from year to year. Um, and so the 148,000 roughly then beyond that, what's that? Uh, going to let me, uh, I'd have, let me pull that open. That was line 1.060. Which line was that again, Simon? I apologize. No, that's all right, sir. It's 1.60. 1.060. It's the all other revenues line, Dave. Oh, interest. Interest, Simon. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, we're dropping. Uh, we had four hundred and fifteen thousand dollars of interest last year. I'm estimating three hundred and fifteen thousand this year. That's a drop of a hundred thousand from year to year. And then we're dropping to half. We're going down to a one hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars. And so right now, from twenty to twenty-one, we're we're forecasting about one point two million dollars less in revenue. Correct. That includes the drops in in the federal in the state revenues. We're also awesome. anticipating a five percent reduction in our collections of property taxes. Uh, now, the problem with not the problem with property taxes; those aren't going to go away. However, it's not a loss. It's just deferring it to future collections. So we will receive that sometime in the future. Um, and then we also have the casino tax revenue and uh, what else did we talk about? And then on the expenditure side, do we anticipate, do we have any idea what we would be able to reduce those? Like for example, personal services? Yeah, we've already built into the personnel services uh, about four or five, I believe it's five positions through attrition that we're currently not going to uh, look to rehire for next school year. And those are the only cuts there. And we do have some cuts in the other site sections as well. So right now, that's where we're at. I mean, again, we're not trying, the five-year forecast is to try to show that we are still healthy over five years. Normally, if you end with a negative balance somewhere, you have to go and show how you're gonna do a, a levy. Or, or we have to make cuts and figure out what we have to do. I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to go through and slash this as much as possible right now without having more information on what's going to occur with next year's school, uh, our, our school, what's the word? And what, what's our balance? Is, is that the 1,380,000 that we'll have? 
That is correct. Year five. That is correct. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dave, I'd like to jump in on this if I can. Sure, Ann. Under revenues, I understand it's sort of a crystal ball methodology. I get that. Uh, part of that revenue prediction also would um, take into consideration we've got four plats opening up, four new housing develops opening up, um, which will, you know, I think reasonably calculate for families moving in with children that will be attending our district as um, in resident students. So when we start talking about these, you know, inflow outflow of cash, I just want to bring that to the attention as well. Um, I know in my area, they just opened up 25 home lots in Rosewood alone. Plus there's uh, another development going in at Curry Branch. Um, another Cedar Grove still out here on Kessler Cows Wheels being developed. And then I believe there's been an application now for another development out on Michaels Road. So I do think it's important to bring that into the equation of discussing revenue in and revenue out. Um, I, would, I would be hesitant, Anne, uh, okay. because, because the state found foundation for fiscal years 20 and 21, mm -hmm. the revenue received for our children, for the students that attend, was frozen at the 2019 uh, um, average daily membership or enrollment, 2019's number. So even though you may see more students come in, they're going to freeze us on what we had in 2019. Now they do have a small dollar amount that we'll receive for enrollment growth, but it's not very much. How long will that freeze be for Dave? It's through 2021, but okay. we won't know what's gonna happen for the 2022, 2023 budget or the 20. But isn't it, but isn't it also true that in Tip City, over 50% of our revenue comes from local funding? I think it's yeah, 50 I mean, points. If you look at our property taxes, that's the biggest part of all of our revenue. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's 54%, Ann. So that's my point on the, you're talking about the, the inflow of state aid. I'm talking about the inflow of local. Oh, that's right. Yep, 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 yep. I apologize. And so, you know, I just want to bring that into the equation. I'd also like to bring into the equation because I don't think there's been a lot of really accurate information given. I'm not rehashing, but I think it's important because Dave, you and I had this lengthy conversation the other day and I reached out to ODE and it's a, it's, it, I think it's a, a very misleading narrative to suggest that all these open row enrolled kids are bringing in an even dollar amount of $6,020 per head. When in fact, we've discovered that uh, open enrollment kids of about 15 from non-contiguous districts are not bringing in $6,020 per head. So, you know, as we continue to pound this drum, I just, it's my, it's my goal to bring uh, accurate information as much as possible to our community. And I think it's a disservice to lump all these children together and just make it a short, sweet narrative. It's $6,020 per head. When that's not the case for the non-contiguous kids, we haven't factored in the full-time equivalency of our students being here. We haven't even discussed those dollars that move through our door and then move on to a joint vocational school. So I'm, I'm just, you know, I wanna put that on there because there's a little more layering here than I think we're, we're saying. That's about Not sure why we went into to that. And yep. Yep. I'm, we're yeah. talking about actual and forecasting. And I think because that, the reason I went into it, I, Simon, I'm, is point of order, I'm talking, uh, point of order, I'm talking to point of order. No, I have no, the floor. point of order. Simon, point of order. I, I have talking. the floor. Point of order. I have the floor. I don't think so. I'm talking about. I don't think so. My discussion <laughs> wasn't over. You interrupted me. Teresa, you, I can mute. you brought this up. You brought this up under under the revenue. So. Why are we hashing this? Because you're hashing it, Simon, and I'm wanting to bring in a balance of credible information. You know, I disagree with your characterization of what you just stated. When, when we're talking about $6,000 per student, what we're talking about is if you divided the total number of students with the total money of revenue 
that's the number they bring in because they're not only bringing money for what they bring in from their own local school district, they're also bringing money for the, the, the students that we have that were required to take as part of the staff. And so you can keep trying to. 15 children. Are I am from talking, Ann. Stop interrupting districts. me. I am talking. Stop interrupting. You can keep continue couching things in the way you, in the terms and the questions that you want to ask. But the bottom line is, is that that's reducing revenue. So I do not appreciate any inference that the information I provided or, or, or arguments I made that were two meetings ago were somehow inappropriate or inaccurate. I feel that they're absolutely accurate. My question about the revenue is to understand how much we are losing and how much we are making sure I understand that we are actually now gonna be below about $1.2 million over two years. Just because open enrollment is part of that line item does not mean I'm trying to rehash this and quote unquote, beat the drum. I have a okay, question. Can I, really can I finish now? I'd like to have my follow up to that. Yeah, Number one, thank you. Number one, Simon, uh, you, you say, you know, $6,020 per head student. I don't think you probably even know what these non-contiguous kids are getting paid in terms of state aid, do you? Because it's not $6,020. $2,468.20. The same well, as the, the ODE representative told me $3,252. But the point the is. The representative was not correct. Okay. That's, uh, you know, I will have to circle back, but the, that's the major point here. It's not $6,020 per student. And that's what's been perpetuated by someone. And it's unfair to our taxpayers to perpetuate that. And it's very unfair for someone who says they stand behind accurate information to our community to be perpetuating inaccurate uh, information to our community. That's point number one. Do you have a comment? I, I did. Um, do we know if um, Dave would, under the same line, would students leaving our district for ed choice be included in this? I don't believe st students leaving for ed choice will have any impact. I believe the only, uh, Greta and I looked into this the other day, and it's only if those students were in ed choice last year will it have an impact on us next year. And we had no students in ed choice last year. So we are, so those two buildings, because I saw an, another list where it was on there. So. Mm -hmm. For next year Students that are in those buildings are not allowed unless they were already enrolled in a private school to use that choice is that how that's going to work for next year that that's correct if they were enrolled in ed choice last year they will be allowed to be enrolled in it again this coming year but that they will not be adding to it's uh but the other aspect of it is that uh if someone would move into our district that had been enrolled in last year, then they would have that opportunity to access Ed Choice. But if Do we, we know, and at this time we don't have anyone to our knowledge that it, okay. it's that, but that you know we still have an entire summer and to to go yet. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, not, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Joelle. I'd, I'd like to. Whoops. Oh. Dave, can you um, speak to uh, College Credit Plus, how you're looking at those numbers and the impact it'll have to the district? I'm not looking at those numbers right now. I'm considering it to be consistent with the prior fiscal year. Is that one of those where the money flows through the district, comes in, comes back out? That is correct. So what I, what I wanted to follow up also on revenue in versus expenditures losing revenue, um, I think a, a more complete narrative on open enrollment is also to talk about the money we're losing from our own district, from our own kids who are leaving our district to go to other, other districts through open enrollment, which I believe is about 51. And so I, I personally have an interest in those students as to why they're leaving and what can we do to build a better mousetrap to keep them here. And so I just want to make this as, as eye-opening as possible to the public. And that's why I'm interjecting these comments. 50-some uh, kids leaving our district that live here, I think that we have an obligation to find out what's driving that and what we can modify as a district 
to keep them here, provide, provide that service and keep those dollars in our district. And that unfortunately is not really getting addressed or emphasized as much as I think it should be. And that would be a great topic. Um, we have the perfect time for that with Mr. Stefanik coming in. And that, you know, as a board with a new superintendent, that might be, you know, one of the things that we put on our list because mm -hmm. it's a, you could put it under customer service, you could put it under a lot of different categories, but that is something definitely worth looking at for sure. Well, when it's 50 some children leaving with $6,020 per head, yes, I think it's very significant. Okay, yeah, I agree. That's, that's something that we could put on our, you know, a work session for maybe the fall. And that's just why I'm saying my emphasis is really going to be focusing on our residents and taxpayers and building the best product, the best service that we can in the most cost-effective way. I agree. Are there any other comments? Lauren, do you have a comment? Uh, I have one other question, Dave, on the expenditures employee retirement insurance benefits from 20, from 2020 to 2024. I, I know that's your, you know, sort of your prediction. Is there, wow, that just seems like a big jump. Um, it's because it, of the health insurance line item. Because we don't know what's going to happen to health insurance. And so we've budgeted a 10% increase each year and that gets pretty big, pretty quick. So yeah, uh, there's just, the only thing we can try to do is control costs in there. Uh, we did that the first step last year by making this year self-insured. Self, self um, right now we're seeing some uh, success with that. I'm hoping that we'll know more, we'll have better results at the end of this first year of self-insurance that we can bring those 10% increases way down. Okay. And ESC, that's a, a huge, where does that fit into here, Dave? That 1.6 million. It's in other objects. Which is what number? Uh, 4.3. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Wow, is there, yeah, I know this could be for a later discussion, but that's something I've got my eye on at 1.6 million. I don't know if it's, you know, doing it in house would be cost more cost effective in some areas. Um, I just we have just we have discussed that, Anne, and that's definitely something that I think is a valid work session topic. Um, I've had that conversation with Dr. Kampf and Dave and Corinne when we kind of set the agenda, when we first, when this first came up, I think in April. So we are on the same page as you that that's definitely something we, we can look at. That we should revisit. Because yes, what is bothering me is in that 1.6 million that we're farming out, so to speak, we don't even have in-house our own psychologists, school psychologists and speech language pathologists. And I think with at least a 13% student population, um, that's in the exceptional category, exceptional children. And then when you look at all of our students who could also use benefit and need psychological or in, in service as well, I do think it's very important and worthwhile to revisit if we can be cost effective and bring those services in house under our budget and not farm it out to ESC. So Dave, I guess what I'm saying is heads up, you know, I'd like to have some information. I think it could be very beneficial to look at what we might save or not save if we, if we bring those employees in house. I'm done. Dave, thanks for putting this together. It'll be interesting to see how it changes between now and November when you do it. Again. Yes. Very informative. Anybody else, Corinne? I heard you trying to jump in a few minutes ago. Did you have something to say? Uh, no, I, I, I like okay. Ian's pointers. I, I thought it was very interesting. And Ian, just to let you know, when I had my one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Stefanik, um, 
program audit is something that I suggested to him. So this is something that's on his radar with the ESC. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Oh, what, Dave, what's the final thing on the CUP report, the very last item? I know it's not on here, but I just don't quite understand what that fits under. I don't have that pulled up. I don't know what that is. Because we were significantly higher than state and similar districts at 7% versus like one point something for the state. So I was very interested in why we're at 7% versus a one point something at state level. But, okay. I, I would just suggest in the future that ask me that question before the board meeting and I'll have it ready for you. All right, fair enough. Okay. So, hey, Dave, when you do get that, can you just send it to all of us so we all have it? On the 7% versus the one, just send it to all of us. So it's all the last item on the CUP report. Hey, what? Just... And specifically, I don't know what that category is encapsulating, Dave. That's why I, I, I did research as much as I could. And I can't find out what exactly that falls under. What what, what is that? It's, I just noted a, a great disparity between our district and similar districts and statewide. So. Does it have a number next to it, Anne? I think it was like 70 something. I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me. It was it's just the very last item on there. I might have a copy of that on my clipboard here. No, I, I have it. Yeah, for a second. I'm just going through, I have so many papers printed. Yeah. And I do not have the cup report down here. Okay, I'll try to claim it here. Other expenses as a percentage of operating expenditures. Okay, what number was that date? Or is that? Line 61. 61? Line 61 shows the percent of the total operating expenditures devoted to other expenses not categorized above. So that would be our ESC expenses. Okay. okay. So that's where we're at. What, what do you see on that 7% and our statewide and similar districts like one point something? Am I correct? I think it was like 1.7. I'm, I'm going by memory. I haven't looked at that report like in two months, but I think it's like 1.7. <laughs> no, it's been a while. So there we go back to ESC. Obviously, you know, I just feel that when we're dialoguing about revenue lost from our district, we really need to open this up to a broader uh, perspective of, of how to, to manage our money and not just keep focusing on open enrollment. That's all I have to say about it. It's a lot, a lot of things to factor in. Okay, anybody, anybody else have any comments? Okay, it's time to move on. I, uh, I think we're ready for a vote, Dave. I think all the comments are, have been out. Heatherly. Yes. Oh. Yes. Run away. Yes. Patry. Abstain. Zakor. Yes. Okay. Motion oh, carries. Sorry file file about that, go ahead, Dave. Tomorrow. Sorry, I, I interrupted when I said motion carries. What did you say? I say I will file this with the state tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, last That's item on the treasurer's yeah, Go ahead. The last item on the treasurer's report is the Ohio checkbook update. Just letting everyone know that we are uh, putting fiscal years up onto the Ohio checkbook. Um, we're about halfway through. We hope to finish that up soon. I received another file today. I haven't had a chance to put it on yet, but we're getting there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say which fiscal years or all. We're going back to 2009. Okay. So. Do you have an estimate when you think you might have that up? Uh, just as fast as Amy Ijanek can pass me the documents as she reviews the non-public information and gets those out of there. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I, know that, I know that I have been a thorn in your side about the Ohio checkbook. Um, 
but I try to only bug you when people email me. So I, I, I just want to let you know, I appreciate that. And um, I always reach back out to the people that email me to let them know that you're working on it. And they also just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much. And that's all yep. I have for the treasurer's items. Okay. Um, old business. Hang on for one second. My Chromebook does not hold a uh, does not hold a charge. Here we go. Our internet connection. Okay. Old business. Eight A. Motion to not accept any tuition student applications for the 2020-2021 school year. I'll move. Can I get a second? I'll, I'll second. Oh, go ahead. Moved and seconded by Dahl and Zakor. Is there any discussion? Does this have to do with the draft procedures or policies that we received? Yes, ma'am, it does. Um, this is basically a follow up from our last board meeting. So this, are we adopting one of these draft policies? Yes, we will be later in the meeting under new business. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Is it, yeah, new business. I forget. Let me check what item here. Is it under the policy? Non-rule of contract resolutions. Dave, where is that? Yeah. Under the first read in miscellaneous. Okay, miscell sorry, Joe Allen, it's in miscellaneous. I was looking under new business. Okay. I guess I have a question. Um, how are we going to take action based on a board policy that still hasn't been read for its first time yet? Don't we need to wait till having to have two official readings before we're voting in this manner, which is consistent to the policy we're about to adopt? I yes, we will have two reads. Um, last month, we voted on the five individual students. So what we're trying to do is just do a, a, you know, a general policy so this doesn't keep popping up every single month because of now there's no official policy. So once we get the policy, we can just refer to the school policy and we don't have to go through this every month. But yeah, you are correct, there will be two reads. First read tonight and we'll do the second read at the next meeting. Have we received additional applications for tuition? No, ma'am. Dave, have you received any? I haven't. Okay, Dr. Cohn, have you received any? No? Okay. No, none at this time. None that we know of, Joelle. I guess I'm wondering why we need the policy if we would just evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis as the applications come in. I just feel like it's always good to have a policy in place. That way, you know, you're covered. And if the board changes their mind next year, we have the policy already written so that it will reflect that. And you know, it's good to go. You can just do two reads and, and get the policy in place. You can never go wrong with having a policy. But are we adopting both policy drafts? No, we'll just adopt the one that either passes or fails. So then future boards would then have to vote to rescind that policy if they wanted to open up tuition. Correct. Well, doesn't it come up for renewal automatically? I thought it did. It does every year. Correct. It does every year. Oh, no. no. Tuition is different. We're talking. Oh, sorry. She's talking about open enrollment. You no, said open I'm, enrollment, right? No, I'm talking about tuition. Isn't that what we received? The, the two policies? Yes. I think it does say it's reviewed on a yearly basis. I believe by March 31st, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So. It will be on, um, it will come, in other words, it will, if I understand it correctly, it comes before the board annually. Is that right? The As written in the policy. The po okay, I didn't see that, Ann. It says that in the new policy that we're going to review tuition yearly. I thought it did. I think that's what the policy needs to be, that the board will review it and then make a determination each year. The way that this is written, it is to to not accept tuition going right. forward without the board then would have to follow the steps to rescind that. Well, I don't think this is. No, um, that's I, not. I, the board does not permit. 
Yes, it, I mean, it, it does indicate it as Ann was referring by March 31st for the upcoming year, the board uh, determines to adopt a policy to permit. So it will stand as is unless by that day <laughs> in March, you do, uh, in a sense, it's almost like a rescind, you you change. Co well, correct. Well, don't vote on it every year though. It says by yep. March 31st of the upcoming year, the board determines to adopt a policy to permit the acceptance. Correct. Now, discuss it, discuss it or vote on anything March 31st, unless before that, we as a board decide we would like to um, have you. tuition students again. Correct. Okay. So if a new board, a new board would need to act and have the discussions completed by March 31st, if they, if, do if they want students yeah. by the start of the following school year. Right, right. So there's a recension, there's a recension happen in a single vote or is it like adopting a new policy where you have to have multiple reads? The way it's-, it's It would be both. Both, yeah. You would have to rescind it and then you would have to read, you would have to have two reads of the new policy to then accept tuition, just like we're doing on, on possibly doing on this one tonight. And, and so I, I guess I have two things here is first on this, we don't have an existing policy for under which we can make a, a prospective denial of any applications until it passes. And that's my first thing related to this vote. Second, can you repeat that, Simon? The, way, the way this policy is written. Hey, sorry, Simon, to interrupt, but could you repeat that? Because you zapped out and Corinne could not hear. Okay. So right now, there's a motion before this board mm -hmm. to make a prospective determination that we are not accepting any tuition students the 2020-21 school year. Now, we don't yet have a policy addressing our ability to do that. There is a policy be that there's, there's two sets of policies pro provided by our council, one that permits tuition acceptance and one that does not. The one that does not indicates that we do not accept or admit tuition students and that we can evaluate this policy on an annual basis. Correct. That, to me, is not desirable. But that means that every year now, if we ever want to change this, we have to enter into a, a first and second read situation versus just making a determination. We could certainly have a policy that permits us to do it and that we will make that determination annually. We don't have to make our policy determinative of whether we will or will not. To me, that seems like a way to handcuff future boards unnecessarily. The board, because it, it, if we think about it, whether you have three votes and they're a yes or no, they're gonna carry the day. You're just gonna add obstacles and creating policies and things like that. And that's more likely, I think, to create problems down the line when there's no more institutional memory related to what occurred today. So my suggestion would be is that we revisit these policies to be combined where the board has the authority I don't think we have the authority based on my understanding of what our policies are to do this vote. And I, I, I would suggest that we revisit this policy to be a combination of the giving the board the discretion to do it on an annual basis, not to have to revisit the policy. I would agree. That was my, that was the point of my comment. You said it much better, Simon. Yeah, there's always two ways, there's always two ways to look at everything. I, I fully understand and appreciate that. The way I look at it is if you have a policy in place, everybody knows where they stand. You know, new parents wanting to come to our district that, you know, that aren't contiguous can look at this and say, oh, you know, they don't have a tuition policy, so we need to look at a different district. It just eliminates this constant, you know, every month, this 30 minute conversation that we've been having since February regarding this whole topic of conversation. So there's two ways to look at it. So we just started talking about tuition last month. So this is not open enrollment. This is about accepting tuition. We had five applications and we voted no to those five applications. And you just said there have been no additional applications received. So why not just give us the discretion to evaluate them on a case by case basis? And I agree with Simon, we need to write a policy that allows the board to decide from year to year on tuition not make a blanket statement going forward that we won't ever have tuition without rescinding that policy. Well, that's what we're voting 
And so, I mean, when, we're, when we get ready to vote, you can vote in the appropriate manner. And did you have a comment? No, I just said I thought that's what council gave us was a yeah. This is what this is what this is what council, council gave us. What that was all about. Correct. This is what we just given us something, but it does not reflect an opportunity to make a decision annually. This is designated a stated mm -hmm. policy that we do not admit it that we may, but we don't, and that we have to revisit this policy annually. It does not permit us to make the decision that we will on any given year without us reviewing this policy, then having to have another policy drafted, then having to have a first read, then to having a second read. This is handcuffing future boards unnecessarily. Well, I don't think it's a big problem. They're think fee expenses. I think sometimes, Simon, um, slowing the wheels of government isn't always a bad thing. And exactly. making boards slow down and think and work in advance, there shouldn't be a rush ever. And if they want it, in the future, they should work diligently to change it and come up with policies that are appropriate that will be followed through. Well, I noticed Thanks. later on in the agenda, it lists just the policy draft of the rejection of two ocean students, whereas the vacation and holiday support policy lists both drafts. So I'm wondering why the acceptance of tuition policy draft is not included. It's a good question. Go ahead. No, I'm asking why that other policy draft is not included later on in the agenda. Well, due to the fact that last month we had five students ask for tuition and it got voted down, it, it seemed like a, a natural correlation. And I'm not allowed to talk about the session, so I will not. Um, you know, this is. Our attorneys gave us two, two forms, one for acceptance, one for rejection. Joellen's, Joellen's question is, is why is only the rejection on, on the, the agenda versus selection of a policy? I think that's a great question. Well, I don't, I, all I can say is due to the conversation that we had, this looked like, you know, this looked like a natural correlation. We can, if depending on what happens, we can always, it, <laughs> It's hard to have this conversation without discussing executive session. So I'm it, kind of- It's really not, Madam President. Uh, respectfully, the-, the I believe it is. Discussion is where- I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I just, I, I disagree because I, I can't discuss what we discussed in executive session. And if I answer the question, I will be talking about executive session. So I, I don't really know how to answer the question at this point. Well, the- you can talk about things that are naturally related to to what needs to be enacted. There is no actions taken in executive session other than the result of that executive session is that we were provided two tuition policies to consider. Now that has to be deliberated and discussed in the public meeting. And so naturally, I would have presumed that the agenda would have presented us with both tuition policies and let the members then deliberate in the public meeting. Joellen's point is well taken, is that, that this board has only been presented with the rejection, not the acceptance, which conceivably, unless this vote's already been determined for some reason, which I can't imagine how that could be, would, would lead it to be a negative result automatically. And so I would suggest two things. First, I don't think that we have the authority to vote on this particular line item. Secondly, Later on in the, in the new business, when we talk about this tuition policy, I think both tuition policies need to be be displayed, revealed, and discussed and deliberated. I, Go ahead, Corinne. Okay, um, I do remember one of the things that we discussed is that we did not have a policy in place for this coming year that would fairly and equitably allow um, access to tuition students to the schools. So that being said, the whole idea was we're going to say, no more open no more tuition students because we didn't want to create a false sense of hope that parents could apply for tuition and then they might be accepted because we were always going to open and consider it it was just saying no there's no tuition and we're going to move forward now we have a policy because we didn't have a tuition policy before and what we were claiming to follow was an open enrollment policy and um 
not sure that that was really being done as as diligently as it should have been. So this was more of a um, like just being able to communicate to people we're not doing tuition. Well, you don't have any additional applications. So I think the message is clear that we're not accepting it. And if we do get any future applications, we will vote on them just like we did for the original five applicants. Well, we don't know why people have or haven't applied, Joellen. I mean, right. Right. No, I'm just saying we haven't received any additional applications for tuition. So and I don't think it's fair to accept some more and vote on them again. I mean, that that's just um, a redundancy that is playing a paper game with parents and with students when it would be completely in unfair and inequitable to now at some point allow tuition students after we have already said no to some tuition students because we didn't have a policy. Right. And the other thing too is because we didn't have a policy in place, there was this big question of, are they coming in under open enrollment? Are they coming in under superintendent waiver? Because we had no policy in place, this was all kind of muddy water. And to your point, Simon, when myself, Dr. Kampf, Dave Stevens, and Corinne set the board agenda, we did discuss on, are we gonna put one policy on here? Are we gonna put both policies on here? And we ended up doing the way that we discussed it as a board. So that is how we are moving forward with the board agenda tonight. And this is exactly how legal counsel told us to approach it. And that is exactly what we are doing. The legal counsel told you that after legal counsel emailed and presented this board with two different policy options to only present one for the agenda. Is that what you're indicating right now? She, present, she presented both. And per her guidance of the, of the Board of Education, we gave her a direction and that, that is what she did. The Board of Education did not, I did not give her that direction. We discussed it in executive session, Simon. This was all discussed in executive session. Well, I, I, I disagree with what instructions she's been okay. providing because I don't understand why an attorney would provide us two different policies. I think we're getting off tangent here. Oh I, I, Simon, I think I can clarify that. What happened was we said that we weren't, we were going to say no tuition for the upcoming student school year. And then she was going to craft a policy if we wanted to have a, um, like a work session on it over the summer where we could really dedicate time to making sure we have a policy that's fair and equitable, and then vote on that policy if we want to then implement it for a following school year. So I think that's why she sent us two. But I mean, this is, I, I've, I've been going crazy at home too. So I, my memory could be incomplete. Yeah, no, she sent the second policy in the event that next year before March 31st, if the board changed their mind and decided to accept tuition, the policy would already be, be written. We wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel that the policy was already there and we could just pull it up and vote on it and completely go in a different direction. That is why she prepared two policies. Well, is it later on the agenda that we would have some discussion about the two drafts that were presented? It seems to me that we would have one policy that gives the discretion to the board to determine each year whether we're going to have tuition or not. That's the I policy. Don't think that it has to be all or nothing. But that's not? the one that has the March 31st date. Right. So the policy, that, the policy, there's, I don't understand why these are two options two distinctively different policies they should be combined into one policy providing this board to make the determination annually that was my feeling of what i was going to get presented not two separate policies i think that that's what needs to be deliberated and discussed no i she did two policies i know uh, well all i can say is this is the way it's being presented tonight if somebody had a question they they've had ample opportunity to reach out to myself to corinne to Dr. Kampf, to Mr. State, to Mr. Stevens. I believe the board agenda went to everybody on. I, we can't deliberate about the board agenda and how you're presenting or not presenting. You could have asked a question. Counsel. You we could have asked a question. You could have even reached out to legal counsel to say, hey, I'm looking at miscellaneous under new policies first read. I'm only in policy. Should there be two policies? We've all had it since Thursday to address this. So now here we are Monday. We're discussing this again for 30 minutes and it, it's being presented as it's being presented. That's just how it's going to be. Well, 
I, I disagree. Object I to that. I respectfully ob object to that. I think that that I cannot engage in discussions with you or Corinne about how you're presenting the agenda or what's going to be on it or what or how it should be presented, anything like that. Because at that point, we're going to start deliberating about school business. I can't. But Simon, then you could reach out to Dr. Kahn. You can reach out to Mr. Stevens, or you can reach out to Helen Carroll. Or, or, or our, our agenda and the materials presented could include both things that were provided by council, rather than making a, a decision, two, two members of this board making a decision that it's not going to be presented to the board in entirety and to the public. Okay, it's not two members of this board, Simon. We discussed this in executive session. I keep saying that. All of the board members discussed this in executive session. I don't know what you want me to say. We discussed it in executive session. Corinne, myself, Dr. Kampf, and Dave Stevens have made an extreme concerted effort this year to get these board agendas out to board members before Friday night or Saturday morning. I, I want to say this came out. Dave, when did the board agenda to get sent to all board members? Oh, he's on mute. The timing of these board agendas, Wednesday? Madam President. The bottom line is, is that I cannot deliberate and discuss matters of school business with you, even if we do it through separate emails, because it's going to be a serial discussion. So if you have two different emails with two different board members about the same subject, about how it should be presented or discussed, that's deliberating about school business. Find the and that's why I'm telling you to reach out to Dr. Kampf, Dave Stevens, or Helen Carroll. That's why there's four of us in these agenda meetings, because... To your point, you're exactly correct. That's why Dave Stevens is available. He's not a board member. Dr. Kumpf is not a board member, nor is Helen Carroll. I think that's probably why it's designed that way. I can't speak through an intermediate deliberation. A tele like Sorry? A telephone is still violating the Public Meetings Act. I, I, Ms. Simon, and I could be wrong, but is your, is your concern that they're, both of the policies are not on the agenda? Is that, My concern that, is that both both of these policies should have been presented. Okay. Agenda. So um, I I'll just be honest. I didn't even notice that they the both weren't on there since they were both in the email. I just assumed. I, I don't even know. But if you have concerns like that, you know, like Teresa suggested, Doctor St or Mr. Stevens, Doctor Kampf are great places to start. And that's I don't think that's a deliberation when you ask that they both be added. So Dave, let's just do this because the board agenda is a fluid document. Let's just let's just add it um, to new policies. First read, and we'll just read we'll just read both. Is that let's just? I can do that, and she uh, said this, both. So let's just read both. It Why won't be the first read because it sounds to me like we need changes to the policy. Why do we need two different policies? We need one policy that allows the board to figure this out from year to year. That's what we had, but that's that's, we had. Once no, we, don't. we have one that says we will not accept tuition. That's but what you're proposing. Be, but it's going to be reviewed on March 31st every right. year. We can review yeah. every policy every year. That doesn't change. That's that's not what we're saying. We don't want to have to review a policy and have to go through two reads. We should be able to make the call every year by a simple vote. Let well, we don't have a policy on tuition, Simon. We've never had a policy on tuition. That's that's kind of why we arrived at this crossroads because we've never had a tuition policy. So we're trying to correct that to make things easy and straightforward for everybody, for staff, for parents, for students, for the board, for the administrators. That's, that's, that's why we arrived at this point. Well, I'm not yes. disagreeing with you. What I'm saying is, is that the current presented policy, non-admission students makes the determination that we will not admit tuition students. It does not provide us the ability to, to, to vote differently it provides us the ability to review our policy annually, which we're supposed to do anyway. I mean, this is so, kind of it, so you want a policy in a that very nice, policy. colorful way that's made us to believe that we have the right to revise this. But all it is, it's making us have to redo the whole policy again. What so I'm, you want a policy that our policy us should. Vote? What I'm saying is that our policy should state that we have the right to annually vote on this by March 31st. Not that we have to revisit our policy and have go, to go through two reads. I understand that. Some, some people of this board feel it'd be great to create obstacles for future boards, but I think that that's doing a disservice to the school district. Well, see, I, I, and there's, like I said, there's two ways to look. I feel like we're taking the obstacles away. By having a policy in place, you're taking the obstacles away. And that's my opinion. That's
That's my way of looking at it. There's always, you know, is the glass half empty or is, there, is it half full? There's always two ways to approach an issue. Sorry, Karen, we're trying to jump in. No, it's fine. I was, okay. I just, I think it, the way it's written is any board member at any time and any future board can say, I want to revisit tuition. Right. And just have to get the revision done before the 31st. If it's done after the 31st, then it's going right. to be the next school year instead of the following school year. I think writing a policy where we're forced to remember that we have to vote by a certain time every year um, is is like a an, an extra barrier almost, Simon. Like I, I don't agree that that's a good thing to put in a date that we have to vote on it every year. It's an open I mean, policy; it can be reviewed at any time. It's no, it's no different than administrator contracts. All administrators have to give notice by July first. I mean, you just know that, right? And if, I, I guess I, I don't understand. If you excuse how, me, son, I'm speaking. I was speaking. Go ahead. If you give the administrator notice by July first. They're automatically renewed. There's nothing you can do about it. So it, you know, in that in that light, it's the exact same scenario. Go ahead. No, it's not. It's our responsibility to keep track of what we need to vote on from year to year. Absolutely. This, poli this policy is rejecting tuition for all years going forward until a board rescinds that. Correct. Oh, Correct. Not, Absolutely. So I think what Simon and I are saying is why not write the policy in a way that puts the ownership on us to make that determination each year by voting on it. Without having to rescind a policy and rewrite one. It's right. almost like if you don't think, if, if, the, if the board doesn't realize this is an issue in time to have two reads, it's gonna be gotcha. Sorry, you're not doing tuition this year. I don't see why we want to create something that's going to provide for that. We should let the future boards be able to make the calls the way they want. The only reason to draft it this way is to create an additional obstacle to prevent tuition payments for tuition basis students in the future. I think actually the date for the, are you talking about the 31st date, Simon? Is that what you're talking about that you thought was an obstacle for an additional board? No, it's not, it's 31st. This policy, the way it reads, means going forward, we will not be accepting tuition unless that policy is rescinded. I think what I'm proposing is that we draft a policy that allows the board the decision to vote on that every year by March 31st. Do you know how many policies we have, Joellen, that are yes. policies that say yeah. we, don't, we will not do something and they don't have a vote embedded in it? Well, this feels like an agenda to pass this through with the gotcha. The fact that no, that no, both really asked and left off, it already feels that way. Do you know how many policies that we have that state we will not do something and that's our policy? But it, that policy doesn't have a vote date that we have to renew that decision. There's tons of those policies embedded in our, in, in our um, board policies. If, if, what we're trying to do is force a vote on everything that we have a board policy saying that we're not going to do. We will have no time to do any other work ever for Tip City Schools because it will all be mandated votes because you don't like the way the tuition policy was drafted. I just think that it ties our hands, Corinne. I, I you know, I think that, that the, the analogy is flawed. The analogy may I speak? Here. May I have a chance to jump in on this, Madam President? Go ahead. I, I, I don't know the exact terminology, but I'd like to um, end this debate and get back to the action of the motion that we just and, and get on with the voting because yeah. Thank this you. is this is exactly how you know. I'm sorry, <laughs> the majority <laughs> vote is what governance is about. And so I'd like to get on to the business of governance. I agree. Dave Stevens, can you call for a vote, please? What are we voting on? Oh, we're voting on a motion to not accept any tuition student application for the 2020-21 school year. And did we, we already had a first and second, is that correct? Yeah, we did. I think it was Dal Dunaway, is that right, Dave? You're on mute. Dal the core. Oh, okay, sorry, Del Four. Okay. Dahl? Yes. Four. Yes. Dunaway? Yes. Heatherly? No. Patrick? No. Motion carries. New 
Mr. Dr. Kampf, we'll start with you. New business, item A, recommend approval to accept the following resignations as per the agenda. I'll move. Moved, I'll second. Moved and seconded by Dal Dunaway. Is there any discussion? I did just have one comment. Uh, under sure. the, the aspect for uh, our uh, assistant middle school principal, it should say um, typically middle school assistant principal and middle school athletic director. I think it has that middle school has been left out. And I want to thank. No, it says middle school. I just added it. Thank oh. you. <laughs> okay, gotcha. She's clarifying because he fills two roles. Yes. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just didn't want that to get confused with our athletic director at the high school. Any discussion? Anyone? Any comments? We good? Well, we thank them for their service and wish them well. Absolutely. Yes. I think we're ready for a vote, Dave. Okay. Dahl? Yes. Dunaway? Yes. Heavily? Yes. Battery? Yes. The core? Yes. Mrs. Dunaway? Wait, that's you, new business. Item approved. Oh, sorry about that. Motion carries. Item B. Uh, recommend motion of resolution of intention not to re-employ the following non-teaching employees as per the agenda. Can I motion in a second. I'll motion. Motion second by Dunaway, Dal Dunaway. Is there any conversation, any discussion? Um, I do, uh, just based upon financial reasons and the uncertainties we face as we plan for the 2021 school year as a result of the governor's school closures and the order for March 2020 due to the COVID-19, uh, I find it necessary to make this recommendation to the Board of Education that a limited number of non-teaching staff members are non-renewed as the expiration of their limited contracts on June 30th, 2020. And we do value them greatly as staff and that these are not easy decisions. Will we be reassessing these positions as we get closer to the school year beginning? I would say that we will be reassessing as more information becomes available, both with what our service delivery for instruction may look like next year. Uh, and of course they are based on the needs of our students but uh, there's more information that definitely would be needed and also just the aspect of uh, the virus itself. Uh, just a lot of uncertainties right now. And it's my understanding that um, this is just a, a reaction to the COVID situation. The I mean, COVID that's, and, that's and purely, and, Yeah, with, yes. yes. The reduction um, of the funding that we received. Right. The, the uncertainty of funding, it, which is all connected once again to the COVID virus. Hey, Dr. Cohn, I reached out to you this morning, so I don't want to rehash, you know, a, a prior conversation. But, you know, one thing that's extremely upsetting to me is I don't like, you know, I just don't like when people have to get information off of social media. And that's extremely upsetting and concerning to me. So, as a district, do we have any kind of policies or procedures in place that we reach out to people prior to them getting information through social media? Well, uh, as you know, social media is uh, its own animal of nature. And so we can have uh, our best intentions. You know, uh, once again, when things become, information becomes available and becomes then to be projected on an agenda, you know, you make any decisions about uh, whether that's moving close to the, the weekend period and that you would provide information as, you know, quickly as you, you know, quickly on the, the following Monday. Um, 
and sometimes, for example, in this case with social media, that that was very unfortunate. And uh, I know that myself, as well as our assistant superintendent, um, we were very apologetic to each of these individuals as we spoke to them individually today. It's absolutely not the way we would have intended. We value them as our staff members and they have done a great job and they have a heart for the jobs that they are serving. So I, I apologize that it happened that way for them and it was definitely not our intent. Right, I mean, with the board agenda, of course we know that goes public at midnight, you know, on, on Sundays always. So what would have been the ideal time for us to make those phone calls so that this wouldn't have happened? Well, that's a good question because- I mean, is it, is it 24 hours, 48, you know, I'm just right. I'm trying to make sure we don't repeat the same mistake because I can't imagine being any of these people this morning finding out on social media that, you know, that you were gonna be non-renewed. Yes, that's very, very unfortunate. So what is our procedure for like, at what time do we call the people, you know, that are going to be non-renewed versus when it becomes public? Well, as I said, these are not easy decisions. And so mm -hmm. in retrospect, uh, I, I don't want to put a burden on someone over a weekend because households are stressed, particularly with the COVID. But I would say that that would be the action that we would do in the future, that we would not as, not in a sense to put a burden on somebody, but to make sure that we would be ahead of potential social media, that we would probably do that on a Friday before the end of the workday. Right, yeah, I know, I know you guys aren't gonna, you know, let this happen again. So I, you know, I know that you're, you're gonna fix it and make sure that if we have to do this with, with anybody else, that it, that it won't happen in this manner. Is, is that a fair assessment? That is a very fair assessment. Okay. And, I, and I appreciate that. And I know that, that, that it would be appreciated by, by everybody. So thank you. I have a question. May I ask a question? Is Sean Ford's, uh, is this his part-time teaching position or his part-time aid position? So that's a good clarification. I think something came up maybe in a comment that was maybe um, a citizen's comment that this is today, this is about classified positions, which are non-teaching positions. And so we don't we are, know what's going to Oh, go ahead, Joan. Sorry. So, so, so this would be a point five, a point five non-teaching position. This would be an aid position. Okay, thank you. That was the question. And I know we haven't discussed the football contracts because some of the citizen comments, you know, this yes. is not easy as a district leadership team to um, ever make these choices and decisions, and. Um, I know there were a lot of comments about some really good football players that must also, or coaches that must also be um, aides. And this is not, we're not talking about those coaching positions. That's future discussions. That's, you're correct. Those are two separate things. This is an aid position that they served in the district. And as we said, this, this is more about a contract status and it's not about performance. They have been dedicated and committed to our students and we greatly appreciate that. So when the district has had to do this in the past, I can recall that there has been some reassurance to the people that um, are affected that they would be the first called back. Is, is that the same expectation in this circumstance? I would say when Mr. Verhoff uh, and I spoke today, we were very careful about that just because of the level of uncertainty at this time. We don't, you know, as a school district, you know, there's multiple directions unless we have a clear direction from the state that we are going to have to plan for our delivery of instruction for next year. So we may have to plan as many as three different scenarios and it's uncertain about when we will have a definitive answer about whether we will be returning and needing the level of support that is required when we have all of our students or have our students back in classrooms. Right, I appreciate what you're saying. What I'm, what, what I'm asking though, is if there's an assessment to bring employees back, aid positions back, we'll consider these affected people first before considering any sort of outside applicant. I hear what you're saying, yes. If it's the same position and they have served in that role, 
Uh, but it is different because this is not a riffing. This is a non-renewal. So they could apply for the position, but it's not a, it's not a matter of a reduction in force. This is a non-renewal of a contract. So they would apply for a position. And okay. I understand ultimately, they, they yeah. and so as, as, as individuals that are committed to this line of work and working with students and are very effective at that, we would hope that they would once again submit that they would have interest. Yes, I hope they will. But I also understand what you're saying that the the future is uncertain and they, these roles may not be preserved the way that they are under the current table of organization is what you're saying. And the other aspect of the uncertainty that it does provide them the opportunity if they have other opportunities that they know that they can seek those out and, and do that because they know where they are in this matter. So as difficult as that is, I think that's important for them to be aware of and have that opportunity. Right, can I, I just would wanna follow up that obviously this, there, there, there just isn't a win-win here no. because of the uncertainty of COVID-19. And I think providing support and understanding for everybody involved and having to make these tough decisions, I, I, I hope our community will start acknowledging just the depth and breadth of what COVID-19 is doing to all of us, personally, professionally, mm -hmm. and our own personal income and our state income, and quite frankly, our national income. And I, I said it all along, we aren't even in recovery. We're still sitting in the ICU trying to slip through that door into the recovery room gradually. And we don't know what that recovery is gonna look like. And I just wanna thank our leaders. I, I think sometimes, and I can be a harsh critic, I think people know that, but our administrators are, they're nonstop. They are on nonstop mode, you know, late in the evening, still addressing phone calls, still trying to figure it out, still trying to rearrange it still trying to be responsive to the community's concerns and issues. It's the time that we have to come together and support one another, even when these tough decisions have to be made. And so I, I, that's all I'm trying to appeal to, to people is that the, this is unusual circumstances mm -hmm. and let's, try to be more supportive instead of attacking one another. I agree. And especially when so many people on this list are working every day with our kids and oh, these were the faces yeah. that our students saw. And these are um, in some cases, our neighbors, it, it just makes this whole time so much more personal and so much more um, impactful. And it's, it's not easy. I agree. Well, with and the isolation is getting to all of us. I mean, let's, yeah, you know, I agree. I've been married a long time and I love my husband. You know what? We need some distance therapy. We need some, <laughs> we need some distance therapy. learning. We need some restaurant therapy. You know, I, this is distance it's, learning. It's getting old nationwide. Yeah, it is. It, it definitely is. Any, any further conversation and discussion? Dave, I think we're ready for a vote. Dahl? Yes. Dunaway? Yes. Heather Lee? No. Patry? No. Zakor? Yes. Motion carries. Item C, recommend, act, recommend approval of the 2020 summer school staff Staff will provide virtual intervention, credit recovery, and ESY services as per the agenda. Can I get a motion? I'll second. I'll second. Uh, motion seconded by Dahl and Heatherly. Is there any discussion? Our ESY extended school year services have uh, been face to face uh, in the past, but uh, due to COVID-19 that these will be uh, virtual interventions for this coming summer months. 
So will the rate um, be the same if they're doing, if they're not doing face to face, if they were doing face to face, typically how long would they be in a typical daily session? Would they be in a, in a four hour session, a two hour session? That will look differently. Mr. Veerhoff, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so typically um, you would be in a half day or a, almost a three quarters of a day type session if we were in the regular school setting. Um, that is gonna look different this summer in the virtual environment. Um, there will be less time, unfortunately, in, in many cases. Uh, Part of that is not just the availability of our staff, but also the availability of parents to log students on and thing, things of that nature. So we're gonna be working with, uh, with families in the ESY program to develop a schedule to provide as many hours as we possibly can, um, but that they're, they're not going to probably receive the same number of hours as they would have in a face-to-face -face setting. Thank you. Any other comments? Dave, we're ready for a vote. Oh. Yes. Heatherly. Yes. Dunaway. Yes. Patry. Yes. The core. Yes. Motion carries. Item D, recommend approval to revise Mr. Mark Stefanik superintendent contract originally approved on March 16th, 2020 to include an updated language as recommended by district's legal counsel, Retzel and address. I'll make the motion. Anybody gonna second? Second. Dunaway and Zakor, Dave. Any discussion? Do you want me to handle this, Dr. Comfort? Do you wanna? No, that's fine. I mean, okay. a discussion? No, you may you may discuss it if you want to. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so the reason why this came up is when we were going through Mr. Stefanik's original contract, there were a few items that looked kind of just, I don't know what the word is. Uh, Mr. Stefanik coming from North Carolina wasn't familiar with Ohio contracts. And I had never done one before. So we both just assumed that, you know, we were kind of looking at it from a different view. Um, when I sent it to Helen, she did notice that there were a few things on there that she suggested that we change. And specifically, she wanted to address um, the holiday pay and the vacation pay because we don't have any board policy currently for holiday pay or vacation pay or personal pay. So we changed all of that in his contract. And then we also redid his bridge contract and he, he was very pleased with, with both revisions. So let me ask, in the absence of having a specific policy mm -hmm. for the items as it relates to the superintendent, don't you just default to the regular board policy for all employees related to those topics? I'll let Dave Stevens answer that. Dave? Uh, I think we've learned that we didn't have policies for. We had no policies, Joe Mullen. Right. I, I know. I, I acknowledge that. I'm not suggesting we had them. I'm just saying, in the absence of a specific policy targeted to this position, wouldn't that employee then just follow the board policy that all employees follow? Each one is different for teachers. It's supposed to be different for teachers, classified, and administrative. We were using what was noted in the board approved salary schedules. Okay. Except the superintendent and the treasurer are not included in the salary schedules. And those items such as holidays and vacation days are individually discussed. I don't know if personal days, I can't even recall if those are in mind or not, but normally with the superintendent and the treasurer, they have, it's what's in the contract. So, so in the future, we'll be developing those policy drafts. I know that's not the working on that. Just noting that. Yeah, uh, Helen Helen has been working on the holiday policy, the vacation pay policy, and the personal day policy. She's been working on that for um, a month now, Dave. Does that sound about right? A month, I think we've been picking away at that? I mean, we've discussed it in the past few meetings. Okay, yeah, yeah, a couple months. 
Yeah, I know we're talking about the holiday and vacation day policy for classified staff, non-teaching staff, non-teaching personnel tonight. Um, Correct. I believe that we may be, if we don't do one for the administration, it would be then left to the individual contracts, but currently our individual contracts for administrators don't include some of those items, so we should we should be moving on to one for those next. So if I, I if I understand this correctly, the the holiday vacation yeah. and I'm sorry, and personal, there was no policy in the the administrative contracts referenced those, but there was in fact no policy to support that reference. Is that correct? Just what was listed in the board. That's of correct. Hours, yeah. That's correct. So this has probably been going on for some time. Long and time. pardon me? A long time. A long time. Thank you. And so here again, I just feel it's an opportune time to point out this is about thank you to our officers for looking into this. Uh, Mrs. Dunaway, Mrs. Dahl spending a lot of time to reveal to Long you. Long time. <laughs> forever. For, for yes. Forever. To peel back these layers and get to some really root cause things that I think are really important for this district and thank them for leading this direction and getting down to improving things that are that are significant, both in the immediate and long term. Because I'm, I'm my mind is blown that we have policies referenced in administrative contracts that don't exist. I mean, that is like the twilight zone. So I'm really happy that this has been addressed. Thank you to this board and uh, especially to our president and vice president for, for addressing this. And I, I hope the community is thankful as well. And I appreciate that. And it was kind of you know awkward for me to call Mr. Stefanik because everything that you just said, I had to present that to him in a professional way and what is really a professional way to address that? You know, it was, it was, I'll just say it was awkward, but we got through it. Um, and he was happy that we are, are taking corrective measures and he was appreciative of that. And this is a good thing for the district as a whole moving yeah, forward. Yeah, it's always good to have policies. Policies, policies are important, absolutely. Well, it's also good to have a board of education that's digging into these things and peeling them back and addressing them and trying to make them better for the future. Yeah, it has it has been a lot of emails, a lot of back and forth, um, but you know we're we're going to get it done. We're, well, we are getting it done. We have been getting it done. So, thank you for recognizing that. Is there any other discussion? Dave, I think we're ready for a vote. Run away. Yes. Four. Yes. Uh, Dahl. Yes. Heatherly. Yes. Patry. Yes. Motion carries. Item E, recommend approval to hire Mr. Mark Stefanik as a consultant of Tip City Schools for a bridge term period commencing on the 23rd of March, 2020, and ending on the 31st day of July, 2020, and shall include up to 15 work days. Right, so on the bridge contract, the reason why we had to do the revision is for one thing, there was no end date on the original contract. So it basically made it look like he was just going to be, you know, contracting forever. And then the the second item was it didn't specifically say 15 work days in there. So I just wanted to add that to make everything, you know, black and white. And Teresa, Teresa, I'll, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion. Did we not have a motion? Yeah, no, we already motioned and seconded. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We had a motion and second, correct? No. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Joellen. I thought we did. I'll make a motion. Uh, for I'll second. <laughs> Motion and second by Heather Lee and Dunaway. I apologize. I missed that. Okay. So yeah, so he was happy to to um to also have the, the revisions and to have everything more specific. And there were other things in the bridge contract that should not have been in there because they were things that would be typically found 
in a superintendent contract, not a contractor contract. So anyway, all good. He was happy. Great. Thanks for moving that around. Yeah, no problem. It was, he was happy. Any further discussion? Ready for a vote, Dave? Heather Lee. Yes. Dunaway. Yes. Dahl. Yes. Patry. Yes. The core. Yes. Motion carries. Item F, recommend uh, action, excuse me, recommend motion to waive the annual performance evaluation for the superintendent for the 2019-2020 school year due to her accepted retirement as of July 31st, 2020. I'll make a motion. Oh, motioned and seconded, Heather Lee Dunaway. Any discussion? Well, I will just say that this was my idea for anybody um, who has served on the board before. These annual performance evaluations take quite a bit of time. And with Dr. Kumpf being in her last 90 days, she's trying to tie up a lot of loose ends, working with Mr. St Stefanik, trying to dovetail into his you know, first 90 days. And we've already accepted your retirement, Dr. Kumpf, so it just seemed kind of unnecessary. And then um, I also have an official letter that we'll give you just so that we all know that it was accepted and it, it wasn't like a punitive thing. It was just, you know, we're all busy doing, doing our thing, so. Okay, thank Back you for the letter. Yeah. Dave, I think we're ready for a vote. You got me in my note keeping. Oh, it's okay, go ahead. Uh, Heavily. Yes. Run away. Yes. Paul. Yes. Patry. Yes. Four. Yes. Motion carries. Item G, recommend approval to accept a $9,500 donation from the LT Parent Association to support the LT Ball Principals Fund. I'll make a motion. Second. I'll second. Oh, uh, was it you, Corinne? It's Ann. Oh, okay. Motion and second, Heather Lee Zakor. Any any discussion? Very generous of them. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, we are yeah. fortunate to have such strong parent support groups uh, in all of our schools. They do make a tremendous difference, and and we miss out on special things during this COVID nineteen, such as our fun fair that has been a long standing piece. And I know that Nevin and Broadway were so looking forward to getting that in place, as well as our students. So uh, LT Ball does a great job, and what how generous of them. And of course, that goes back to the students in one way or another. Yeah, thank you very much. So, are they the group that are recommending how it's used? Not to my knowledge, but uh, Mr. Vagas may have more information on that. Um, I know that they were looking into, uh, they suggested putting in a water bottle fill station, which I had heard somebody mention already. However, it's there's an unknown right now on the plumbing and the piping, because I think one of our older buildings, it was looked into and they said there would be a lot of infrastructure change needed to put in a fill station. Might not be the same for LT, but, our, our uh, custodian staff, our, our maintenance staff, they're looking into that. If we can, we will. If not, they've given Mr. Vagadis, the, it's his funding they're donating to his principal's building fund. Building principal's fund. So, That's nice. Yeah. I think we're ready for a vote. Okay. Uh, Heavily? Yes. Decor? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Dunaway? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Motion carries. Item H, recommend approval of the 2021 elementary, middle, and high school student handbooks. Can I get a motion in a second? I'll motion. I'll second. Dunaway and Heatherly, Dave. Is there any discussion? Um, I've, I sent in a, like the cell phone policy at the middle school. 
I just don't, I think knowing everything that we know about the social, emotional learning and growth of middle school students, they can't handle cell phone and proper use of it. And the best thing we can do is provide the structure and the opportunity to not have that stress in their lives. This is at the middle school, Corinne? Correct. Yes. What page is that on? Oh. Do you know? Hang on, pull it up real quick. It's um, is it 18 telephone or is it under cell phone? I'm still loading. It would be under, it's under cell phone. Let me cell see if I find it real quick. And key page, cell phone. What page is that? I'm looking to. I am too. It's on page 16, I think. Um, 18. No, 18 is telephone. Yeah. Um, Simon, correct. It's on the bottom of page 16, personal communication devices. There you go. So what would be the process for changing that, Dr. Kumpf? Well, that's a very good question. How will we discuss it? I know they've created zones for different things and time frames, And I know that they have even gone to what I would call handbook workshops uh, to try to have uh, language that they felt like that would work with that. I think that in um, sometimes there is that aspect that it might be you know, used as for some of them, that's a, a, a little bit of a downtime. We know that a number of our middle school students carry cell phones because it, it was a way to communicate if particularly because they begin use, doing organized sports at the middle school. So if something's running, uh, you know, longer and, and for pickup or, you know, if, uh, you know, there's a change, maybe asking if someone needs a ride home that, you know, can their parent provide that, just different things of that nature. So. I know that, you know, we're just in electronic world. So our youth do have yeah. cell phones. My, my um, objection is not to students having a cell phone turned off in their book bag until the end of the day when they have to text mom and say soccer practice is over. That's not my objection. My objection is with the policy that allows students to be on their cell phones during lunch during um, that free time that they're taking them into the bathrooms. It's causing a lot of additional social media drama that middle schoolers can't like they almost cannot self-regulate to stay away from that and i think that it would based on you know the research and the articles that we know about social emotional learning and health they need help disconnecting and they need help with healthy boundaries and the best way to do that is to say no um, go sit with your friends and, and chat, go play basketball during your free time. We don't need cell phones out. We don't need social media turned on. Even if we say you're not allowed getting on social media, we can't police what every student is doing on their cell phone device. And then we know that they have been. So it, it's, it's just not um, a good way to help them disconnect and then connect with their peers. So Dr. Kampf, this hasn't been in place very long, right? Hasn't it only been two years that we've allowed cell phones at the middle school? Am I wrong? Does that seem right, two years? I, I would say that the that's probably correct. It may be as okay. many as three. I mean, time goes by. Uh, uh -huh. and, and the use of electronics by our youth increases because, you know, uh, I would assume that, that we even have some at our four or five level that do have access to a phone. You know, it, it's just, it it's becomes more pervasive all the time and a common piece. In fact, I do think a number of our parents reach out to the students and we have to work with them about really not, you know, calling during school hours, you know, unless there's something that's really important and they've always are able to go through a school office for something like that, if something would come up with family. Um, so, like I said, the language and what they've done, they have patterned that off what other middle schools uh, are doing. 
that's uh, more of a common practice as well as things such as even like through PBIS, what they're seeing, what some of the PBIS middle schools are doing with that and how they're creating zones or timeframes. And as I was saying, I think some actually even use it as a privilege that, that it's a motivation for them to be able to get on it for a moment. Um, but, uh, you know, Mrs. Dahl, I hear what you're saying. There are a lot of gracious on our youth. I mean, absolutely. And, and social media is one of those. Mm -hmm. And the telephone is part of that social media aspect. Um, I, I guess in some ways, I would like to hear from the, the middle school administration about their thoughts process and anything that they would want to bring to this conversation, as well as, uh, you know, if there were suggestions about adjusting this, uh, I hate to have the delay too much for handbooks because they do get them published. And, you know, there's a whole time frame and you get the best rate by getting it turned in a certain time and those kind of things. But maybe this would be something that we could bring back uh, for the middle school for the uh, work station possibly so that it would not be too delayed. Yeah, it's not It's not gonna change my vote. It's just, I feel like it's really important and I needed to state that if, if we decide to change it, we can always staple something in the front. Okay, all right. Absolutely. That might be a very good solution, although I, I don't want to mislead anybody on the board. I mean, they'd oh. be voting on as is. I yeah. get it, I get it. But I do hear, I hear your concerns. I will have to say that I absolutely positively agree with everything that Corinne says. And part of the social emotional learning and kids definitely need boundaries. And I have to, I have to believe that some kids would be very relieved to know that there are no cell phones at the middle school. I, I just feel like they would almost be happy you know, I feel like kids need those boundaries. So I don't know what the process would be. Dr. Comp, you mentioned some kind of, you know, reaching out to the TIP middle school administrators, but whatever would be involved in, in this, I would be fully supportive of, of looking into this. There was actually an article about, a, I'll try to find it, a middle school that did ban, and I don't know that that's what Corinne's talking about actually. Yeah, they did, it was last year. About banning, yes, and, mm -hmm. and they said it was an amazing transformation. Yep. How kids would actually sit in the hallway and talk to one another as they were waiting to, you know, for their next activity mm -hmm. of the schedule. Um, it was a little bit, they were hesitant at first, but it turned out to be a very positive outcome for students, staff, and parents. Hey, was that a school in Cincinnati? I, I know I read that article, and for some I reason... Try to track that down. No, don't, I'm not going to hold you to it, but I, I read the same article, and my brain wants to say it was Cincinnati because I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, that's so close to us, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I'm all for it. I think it, would be a, I think it would end up in a very positive result, so... And I just also want to support Corinne's, you know, that, that at this age, that middle adolescent does need a lot of support because it's unfair with their brain development to expect them to be able to self-regulate uh, and, and engage all that. that mm -hmm. It's just not there yet. Right. So I agree. I think it's fair to them to give those guidelines. Yeah. I, I just want to mention, I do think that it, if they have cell phones, which a majority of them will, and they mm -hmm. have it with them, uh, it will be hard for them to keep it in a book bag and not on their person. Uh, one is because they're expensive, it's an expense piece. And so they, they want to probably in a sense, have it on their, their person. We're fortunate that we have good students and we have walkers that are not really bothered by other people for most situations. Uh, but I think it will be a lot of monitoring about making sure if they're not on them because they, they will, I mean, they're on them all the time when they're not there. So it will be, it will be a, a big change in transition. And initially it probably will take a lot of monitoring. Mm -hmm. Aren't these recommendations based on the input of the people that work at the middle school? I mean, who, who contributes to this? Oh, the, the handbook. Yeah. To develop yeah, the handbook itself would have definitely been the administration probably, um, you know, and, and some of the teaching staff, but 
but ultimately it would be like through handbook workshops and, and PBIS meetings uh, and symposium, uh, I'll call it conferences that they go to, they have breakout sessions about different aspects. That would be largely what it would be based off of. I don't disagree with you, Corinne. I just think monitoring would be very difficult. Policing that will be difficult, but I hear what you're saying. But you said, you said it earlier. I think you said it last year too. It's it's just you know the research is there. They can't. It is. We the the problem is is that you let cell phones out. So putting like the genie back in the bottle is hard. And it's going to take a couple years of very um, diligent reinforcement to have students who were previously let, you know, walk around with cell phones now go back to that they're not allowed. And, and Dr. Kumpf, I think you're correct. It would, it, it's going to be a challenge at first to go back. Um, but is it the responsible and correct thing to do for middle-aged children? Absolutely. Well, we keep talking about the blended model and what that might look like in the fall. So if we were going to do it, this would be a good time to do it because if we end up only going back two days a week, that's kind of a, that's kind of a good way to start this. Yeah. But I don't want to hold up this conversation just based on that. Yeah. That's just my comment. Like Joellen said, I said it last year too, because it's right. something I am passionate about. So we can move off of that because it's not going to change. The document's not going to change. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting we change that today for any voting. Right. But put, just put it on a list for a future conversation or like Dr. Kumpf to get feedback from the administrators would be nice. And not just the administrators, but the teachers. The teachers are the ones in the classrooms with these students all day, every day. So what are their, what's their opinion? I would, yeah. I, I would really like to know. They're the ones, with, they're the ones in, that, that are interfacing with the drama. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. That's a great way to say it. That's a great way to say it. So... Dave, I think we're ready for the vote. If I'm if I'm hearing this correctly. All righty. Uh, Dunaway. Yes. Heatherly. Yes. Dahl. Yes. Patry. Yes. Decor. Yes. Motion carries. Item I. Recommend approval to partner with New Creations Counseling Center in Tip City, Ohio, as our preferred mental health agency for the 2021 school year at a cost of 53,500. The agreement is attached. I'll make a motion. A second. Motion and second. Emily and Dahl. Any discussion? I have a question on this. At 53000 a year, okay, preferred mental health agency, what, it, what are they providing? And that would be my first question. The second part would be, is this something that could be provided as well by a school psychologist if we had one? So good questions, Anne. A couple of things. One, uh, I think it's important to point out that uh, presently the cost of this uh, is significantly supported by a, a wellness grant that we have. Okay. And that wellness, and that's from the state, wellness dollars, um, is a, really was boosted up because of the need for the mental health and wellness. Uh, and so for our school counselors, uh, it would, it's, it's a step beyond where it is actually what we call professional licensed counseling, a counseling service. And so they have different credentials. Uh, for a school psychologist, uh, once again, their, their credential is more about the testing, testing. and the, the assessments and the interpretation of those results to indicate whether or not our students might qualify for particular services. So uh, although they have, whether our, it's our, our school counselors or whether it's the school psychologists, they have skills and they have ways that they are able to support, but this in itself is, is for, when we talk about different tiers, this would be for those that are at risk at a level that the one-on-one -on -one or in some situations, one-on-small -on group with a licensed 
counselor is really the level of need that they have. Thank you for that. Also, do you know how much of that 50, 53,000, is that all grant or? Mr. Stevens, can you help me with that? Yeah, we're, we're expecting to pay the entire amount through the student wellness funding that we received from the state in fund 467. Wow, great. Uh, we're currently scheduled to receive, I think it's $153,000 next year. However, um, we're not certain if that funding will still go through, if that'll be something they try to cut. But I do know that when the budget was passed, the, uh, the, the legislature and the governor, they were really pushing on having this mental health wellness money for the students, or the, the student wellness money. So, I mean, even if they cut some of it, they're, they're not gonna cut all of it. So we should be good to go. Great. I think it was back in December of 2018 that our counselors did a really nice presentation um, advocating for this. Uh, and then I think we were all in agreement at that time supportive of this initiative and then the governor came through with the budget. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did over a six month process and worked very closely with the high school at that time and all the counselors across the district and interviewed, I wanna say that might have been as many as four uh, different, maybe up to five different agencies and uh, really looked at what was the best fit for us, what was the best fit for our budget or our potential budget and what was uh, the best connection. And then we even looked at what would be in a sense the most local because we really wanted it to be someone that had a sense of what our community was like and had for that feel of what would be the best fit for us. And, and is this just for students? Yes. This is not uh, okay. Although they, they do connect it with families. I mean, families provide permission for this, all that mm -hmm. piece. And I think that they would provide information if family counseling was wanted as well. And Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but those students who have Medicaid, don't we, don't we bill it to, to Medicaid? Yes, we do. We do. Though, it's Medicaid. a small percentage, but we get that money back from Medicaid. Oh, it, it can get very large. I mean, over a hundred thousand dollars refunded. I mean, we, the auditors, there's a, there's an auditor that comes in and reviews the Medicaid to make sure that we're only billing for appropriate uh, services. And we have a third party administrator that does that for us. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of services that we provide that do qualify for that. Right. So that would not just be this counseling piece. It would be. No, I understand. Well. No, yeah. just that's one comment yes. to that. Right. Yeah. I would, I'd be curious how many districts have moved in this direction. I believe when we started this initiative, there were about, I don't know, two in Miami County. I'd be interested in how many in Miami County now have moved forward. I, I'd say that's been a, a very significant increase because one, the need is there and sure. two, there's some potential funding to help support and uh, three, that they are now seeing that there are some services that are now becoming available that are focusing on helping to support schools. That's very insightful. Thank you for all that background. Do you know roughly how many students have utilized this in, in a year? Just roughly, if anybody knows, of our students? Yeah, uh, Mr. Fairhoff, was that, I wanna know, was it like 35? I'm trying to think what that number was. I, I think it was more than that. I think we were closer to 60 students. Yeah. So I, that my next one was jumping up to like 53. So that probably would wow. get up to 60. And I, I know that over the, the COVID-19 uh, mandated closure, they have continued to provide and make services available, but the parent does need to bring them to the office for that because our schools are closed, but they, they have made that available and I think they have done some virtually as well if that family in the situation felt that that was the safest and best way. So that's good. Dr. Kampf also noted that we are going from four days to five, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and that's important. That okay, yes, sorry. That is important. Mm -hmm. Wow. It sounds like yeah, so we're adding an extra day, Ann. Yeah, it's an amazing value. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, especially for five days. If you think about that, right. I, 
I have a few questions and comments. Um, okay. First, I know two typos. First is on paragraph one, instead of exempted, it says exampled school district. On page two, first paragraph, it lists Covington school district. Which is probably a, a remnant from them having used this with Covington. Okay, help me where that, that one is. Mr. On Covington, page two, paragraph one, last line of that bullet point. I see it, thank you. And then, I, has this been vetted with our, our attorney? I'm not sure we really wanna to agree to that second bullet point on page two related to, looks like an indemnification provision to hold them harmless without better defining that. And also when I'm reading this agreement, it wasn't entirely clear to me what the scope of services would be. And I felt that the language on that third bullet point was confusing at best. I think that it probably needs to be redrafted slightly. Could, could you allow us to catch up here? Um, you're on page two, Simon, is that right? Correct. And you're talking about bullet point two or three, which one? The first one was bullet point one on page two where it had Covington. Okay. The second thing I was discussing on page two related to the second bullet point had some language that we would hold them harmless in the event of any litigation arising from the agreement of counseling and consultation. I think that that needs to be better defined and described and better, it needs to be expanded. I'm not sure we really wanna to agree to a blanket release like that. Number three, I feel that the language as far as the annual per day and five days needs to be rephrased. And overall, I feel like the scope of services needs to be better defined. Dr. Kampf, did Dave Levy go over this original contract when we signed it the first time? I don't know that he did. I know that Do you it remember was Dave Stevens? It's a, uh, a contract that was being used for multiple districts. And so there may have been some comfort with that. Uh, I know that uh, it was looked at. I, I would have to go, go back to see if it had been reviewed before or not by by the other, uh, by Bricker and Eckler. Dave Stevens, can you remember if we sent this to Bricker and Eckler or not the first time we signed it? We did not. We did not? Okay. So, I, yeah, I like Simon's suggestion. I have no problem sending this to Helen, um, especially regarding, you know, that one paragraph in particular. I think this is a great program. I think we need it. Yeah, I absolutely. But I think we just want to make sure that everybody understands the agreement. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, look at all these other things that we have sent to Helen, and she's caught, you know, other little things that we, yeah, yeah, she's a great set of, of eyes, I'll just say that, she's, she's, she's on it. So, well, this, if we, if we don't vote on this now, I'm not disagreeing with you, Simon, but if we don't vote on it now, is there going to be a lapse in service since this is going to start on June 1st? No, I... Oh. Yeah. And does it in any way jeopardize our grant money? No. It, it doesn't jeopardize the grant funds at all. Uh, we would want continuity for sure, because one, the students that are being served, you know, they, they're building a relationship or a comfort level with, uh, to get to the point that really the services are, are benefiting them more. But uh, I understand we do want the, the best and tightest focused contract. Uh, and there are some things that need corrected. Um, There's plenty of time. I mean, we have- oh, a thank you. Is okay. the contract so we go for the this? school year? Pardon? Does it go for the school year? Meaning it says for the 2021 school year. Okay. Right. That's what I was thinking too. So okay. it's not really June one piece. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I will take ownership of sending this to Helen. And um, Dr. Kampf, if you could maybe, we'll figure out how to handle it with the board, like put it in the Friday board update or have her send it to all board members and okay. then add it to the uh, June agenda. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, now, because we have a motion on the floor, how, how are we going to handle that? When I move to table it. Okay. A second. Patrick and Dell. All right, we'll vote. 
Uh, Patry? Yes on tabling it. Yes on tabling. Patry? Dahl? Yes on tabling. Uh, Dunaway? Yes. Heatherly? Yes. Four. Yes. Motion carries for tabling the mental health agency contract until it is reviewed by legal counsel. Okay, very good. And thank you for working with me on that, Teresa. Oh, heck, no problem. All right, uh, item J, recommend approval for Tip City Community Services to use school vans for the summer lunch on us program as needed. Dates of use will be June 1st through August 14th, 2020. I'll move. Moved and seconded by Patrick and Dunaway. Any discussion? Uh, there's just a notation that it will be our staff, our, our employees that will be driving the van. Oh, okay. Hey, that's new this year, right? No, we've always had our staff that do the van for the summer program. I never knew that. No, okay, we, wow. We I knew it was our van, that. but I didn't know it was our, that makes sense. From a yeah. liability standpoint. Yeah, liability. Mm -hmm. Greta, but we're not paying them over the summer. They're just employees that work for us, but they're doing that in the summer. That's exactly right. The we provide the van and they are a volunteer for the program, but they happen to be one of our employees. Okay, that's why I got confused. That's what I thought. That's that's why, I, thank you, Dave, okay. right. Thank you. Now well, I understand. Okay. I, I was thinking it, but it, yeah, it wasn't as clear. I, I haven't paid anybody for driving a van in the summer. Yeah, I, I know who drives the van. <laughs> Yeah. When I say there are employees, there are our employees doing the, during the school year. Absolutely. And they, they're, they're wonderful. Wow. Love this program. And our liability insurance covers them because they're employees that are off the clock. That's a question. What was that? I missed it. She's asking about liability because there are employees. They're not on the clock. Got me. We, we may want to clarify that with our policy or carrier because I'm not sure that that, that would be covered. I, I agree with I you. I was wondering that too. Oh, you know what, Joellen? I think I just read something recently about the transportation laws in, um, related to education in Ohio where it has to be any use of any school vehicle has to be related to, to schooling in whatever way. And, and I know that the lunch on us program is, is tied to our school. I know there's like food being passed back and forth, but, I, but I think it needs to be very clear that it is, it is a school activity <coughs> for the school van to be used. They just changed that recently. Did you, did you read that Dave Stevens? I did not. Well, I think Dr. Kump and I sat in a policy you. session with that with Neola, if I remember correctly. Did you say you covered it with Norm, Ann? I believe so. Didn't we, Dr. Yeah. Kump, talk about that in our... We did. Uh, but, Ann, can you, in, clearly in your mind, where did that land? <laughs> yeah, I'm not clear in my mind where that landed. But I know it was a, a new nuance that had it to be... And I don't remember. Dr. Kump, do you want Kim? Do you want to send this question to Kim, or do you want me to send it to Helen, or do you want to send it to Helen? I want to make sure we have clarification on this. I would send it to Helen. Okay. I don't want to leave like a loose end. Right. So I think since you're um, doing the uh, new creations contract, if you don't. Okay. Sure. I'll do it. Yep. Be in one one message to her. Perfect. Oh. So, well, when does the program start? June first. June first. So that's tricky. Uh, we do have a 20. Yeah. So how will we, how will they have transportation for June 1st? If it, if it, if it has to be a school employee, then we will get that message from Helen, Dr. Kampf. Okay. We can figure out how we can make that work. What school employees getting paid in the summer until, you know, until we can figure it out because the last thing we're going to do is not get these lunches out. So okay. So, I mean, even if it happened to be, uh, for example, our bus mechanic that works during the summer as well as okay. our transportation director, I mean, but, but we'd have to make a decision about that and also work with them to think who could cover that. Right. So let's see what um, Helen has to say, and then we'll cross that bridge when we get to it and, and figure it out. And Dave's going to follow up on the insurance. 
No, I'm going to follow up on that with Helen. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, I mean, it all goes together, so. But wouldn't that be in our insurance policy? So that's why I no. think that's really a follow-up with Mr. Fister because he, he works with our insurance carriers. Would that be correct, Mr. Stevens? Yes. So then I don't need to go to Helen. You're just going to ask Gary? No, well, Helen, Helen. Helen would be about the like the the aspect of an employed person being that's driving it, and do they need to be actively, I'll say, employed at the time on duty, so to speak? Yeah, on yeah. Duty. I would have to believe the answer to that question has to be yes. I don't, I don't see any other way around that, you know. But we'll let Helen decide. Right. Okay. I think we'll need to provide our insurance carrier authority to speak. The employee probably. Come and speak with our insurance carrier, get the policy, the policy, and then make a determination. Pretty much, yeah. And to see if lunch on us is deemed and connected to a school activity, because I do remember discussing that with the mm -hmm. change in Neola. Yep. And then we'll just have to do whatever we have to do to make it happen. Right. Yeah, pretty much. We're going to, we'll have to make it happen. Okay. But I think right, we can so still we go to... forward with the approval. Well, let me read this. How, is, how does it say? Uh, approval for Tip City Community Purpose to use, to use school vans for the summer launch on us program as needed. I don't think we can move forward with that, Simon, especially if that policy that Ann and I can't clearly remember from the old right. It can't, we can't use it for non-educational. I, I think it's, this might be another one that we need to table until we talk and make sure. Uh, yeah, I don't think that, I'm not comfortable passing this as, as stated on the recommended action. Table it. Yeah, I, 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 I would move to, I would move to amend it as follows. I would say to approve the Tip City Community Services to use the school vans for, I'm sorry, I moved this, the summer lunch on a program as needed, and if required, authorize the administration to procure additional insurance policies to insure the van if, if needed, or to, to uh, have our summer employees drive the van that are employed. I, I think that that, that would suffice, because then we can just get whatever insurance policy we need to cover that. But okay. I, I think the policy though, Simon says that we can't use school transportation for anything outside of school, school purposes. activity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that we can allow. I, I think that if you have city community that services precludes that there's probably an endorsement or something additional rider you can get for additional costs. My suspicion is. Um, you're, you're talking about auto insurance coverage and Corinne is talking about a policy of, you know, limiting our, our ability to loan the van for a non-school sponsored activity. Are you saying our policy, right. our actual policies for the school board, not our insurance? <clears throat> right. Yeah. So, so sorry, so I had different insurance policies. Yeah. The Simon, transportation, state Simon, transportation. Oh, sorry. Simon, um, Dr. Kampf and Ann and Corinne are all saying that they, they think Without by exact memory, Neola changed this. And last year we were within our legal rights, but now this year we may not be, and that it just recently changed. So I make a motion that we table this until we um, discuss it with legal counsel. I'll ask second that. I feel like we have to. Okay, motion and seconded by Dunaway and Dahl to table this until we speak to Helen. Dave, you want to call for a roll? You said that was Teresa and who Dunaway, was Dunaway and Dahl, yes. Uh, Dunaway? Yes. Dahl? Yes. Heatherly? Yes, to table. Patrick? To table, yeah. Yes. Four. Yes. Motion carries. Item K. Recommend motion to appoint a treasurer pro tem for the May 27th, 2020 special meeting. 
Make a motion. I'll second. Motion seconded by Dal Dunaway. Any discussion? What's this about? It's just somebody to clear us in and out of executive session so that they can report it to Dave so that Dave doesn't have to be there. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, the, they, will, they will call the roll and act as the note taker for the board on my behalf. Does anybody want to volunteer? Joellen, I think you'd be great at this. I think the president and the vice president should do it. Yeah, I'll gladly do it. I have no problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. All right, there we go. Dave, you want to call roll? Doll? Yes. Dunaway? Yes. Heatherly? Yes. Patry? Yes. Four? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, miscellaneous upcoming meetings. The next special meeting will take place at the Board of Education on Wednesday, May 27th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. Commencement for the class of 2020 will take place virtually on Saturday, May 30th, 2020 at 7 p.m. A link will be provided in the near future. Another work session will take place virtually on Tuesday, June 16th, 2020, beginning at 6 p.m. The next regular Board of Education meeting will take place virtually on Monday, June 22nd, 2020, beginning at 6 p.m. That takes us to new policies, first read. May I ask a question, please, about the next meeting on the 27th? Yes, ma'am. That is, we're going to physically be at the board office? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You good? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm wondering, so if we're, we're doing that then, then why are we distancing and doing virtual on others? Well, because gatherings of 10 or less, we can't allow for our community to come to that. Uh, okay, because this so, is- a Yeah, until, until the governor lifts the gatherings of 10, um, we're kind of, I know, it's, it's hard Thank having you. virtual meetings. Yeah, I, I had a mental block there. Thank it's okay, you. no, no problem at all. Okay, you good, Ian? Yes. Okay, so new policies, first read. Can I get a motion in a second? There's no, this is just a reading. Oh, sorry about that, go ahead. Um, well, it says we're gonna choose one for the vacation holiday support staff. Well, I don't- second reading. So, so then we decide between here and the second reading, which one we, we like. Now, first read may be a, Maybe the yeah, wrong. Help me on this, Dave. Pardon? I said, help me on this. Okay. If if there ends up needing to be lots of changes to these, this is not a first read. Gotcha. This is more of a discussion, and we'll have to do first reads and second reads in June. Okay. But um, so the first policy that was here is the rejection of tuition students policy 50, 5115, uh, from what was mentioned earlier. Uh, Mr. Patrick had suggested that maybe we have a different policy that states both rejection and accepting of tuition students and just have the board vote on it every year. Um, so I don't want to rehash more of that. I mean, if you guys think that this needs more work from the attorney, we can just not count this and we can. Well, we already voted earlier in the under new business to accept it. To do a first read, am I wrong? Well, we've accepted to not accept the tuition students for this year. Right, and that's the, the court, and this is the corresponding policy. So, so if I'm confused if, why it's not okay. Right, if this is the one we want to go with, we can just have this be the first read, and then we'll present this again in July, in June, to do the second read, and it'll be in the system. The first vote that we had in old business was not to accept this policy; it was to reject accepting any students that are tuition students for the 2021 school year. Correct. And 
I would not be in favor of accepting this policy as it creates an obstacle from future boards from simply making a decision whether to admit or, or deny tuition students. And I also have an exception, as you know, as it relates to not having board, both policies here for deliberation and discussion, one in favor of admission and one in rejection. As it was my understanding that we were going to get a policy that provides us the ability to review it, to see it, and then discuss it. And I expected to see one policy with both options available. I can stick it in right now. What does that mean? Stick what in right now? Uh, the second, the one that Simon is saying is not in here, the approval of tuition students. Great. So then I guess then I'm confused Dave, because if you have both policies in there and one is to accept and one is to reject, how does that work? This isn't a first read. This is a discussion on the policy itself on what we want to have. Okay. I would recommend that that policy be revised to mirror the language that uh, Sam, Simon just described. That gives the discretion to future boards to vote on it each year. Can Helen revise it to include that? Does Don't they already have that? No, but we have two separate have, drafts. No, but what I mean is like, can't a board at any time revise any policy? Yes. But it would take two meetings. So what, what I remember- What I'm suggesting is like not that- Both of them. Well, yeah. Maybe. Sorry, Karen, can you repeat that again? Because two people were talking. I thought Simon said we could do both of them because the one policy is just um, how you would accept tuition, I think. I'd have to see it on there and reread it. So if you were to have tuition students, these are the steps and the policies that your district would follow in admitting tuition students. And then the one policy said, but we're not going to have open enrollment this year or whatever it said well i what i'm trying to say is that the non-admission of students on a tuition basis that policy does not give the board the discretion to admit tuition students it only states what is already the board's right which is to review a policy every year and change it by rescission two meetings first and second reading and then finally make it a vote. So I don't, I don't think that's a good way to do it. I think that our policy should be students on a tuition basis may be permitted based on an annual vote of the board. And then if the vote is in the affirmative, then have that in the same policy, what the procedure is. That way each year, every board can make that decision without having to jump through ho hoops of, of providing revisions to policies. But that proposal came from our board Council, correct? The verbiage in that, am I correct about that? Correct. Um, so I, with all due respect, Simon, I'd like to go with what our council is telling us. We have no reason, I don't understand why she did this based on our executive session other than maybe have been directed to do that. So I, I don't agree with that at all. Well, this is not, can, I, I disagree vehemently as to what was discussed and what I was expecting to see and what was going to be deliberated upon. Can't we ask her to come up with a draft that merges it? Merges what, Joellen? Versus something that creates an obstacle. I agree with Joellen. I think we should request that she creates something that provides us the opportunity to do it every year that merges those two documents. Hey, we already have that document, correct? I mean, she wrote two policies yeah. yes. based, on our, based on our direction in executive session we have both policies, is that correct, Dave? I have the other policy, but I'm not sure it's doing what Simon says. <laughs> can you, can we read it? Just. Well, I can. It's all the board members. I mean, I can attach it or I can pull it up as an, or I can pull it up so everyone can see it. Yeah, she sent that to all the board members. Just tell me what you want. Attach yeah, it, you can open it, or just put it up on the screen right now. Ask Simon, this is his. This, this is his issue, so to speak. I think placing it on the board is, is probably the easiest way. Okay, go for it. Yeah, because if I pull up my email, my board agenda is going to click off, so. 
because I always lose my connection on my Chromebook. It is getting cold out. What do you guys see? Acceptance of non-resident students upon payment of tuition. So I'm just gonna read that with this other one. Not admission of students. Yeah, so that, that first policy that has acceptance, that's more what I was expecting to see. This provides us the discretion to approve it doesn't mean we have to, it says we can, and then it provides sure. guidelines. The other one is a flat out rejection. And it sounds like it's giving us the ability to do it, but all it's doing is giving, stating what we already have a right to do, which is to revisit this every year. So to me, just admitting this one, or if you wish kind of merging them, but this one kind of does it by itself, you just have to add the May 30, March 31st review deadline. Correct. So that, that's, that's what my, my statement is. Currently, the one that it seems that this board is inclined to adopt does not include this, these guidelines, does not include all this already kind of inherently in our, in our policies. Yes. Just so have. if I'm hearing you correctly, Simon, you just think that this one is, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you just like the way it's written better. It seems to have more kind of, um, I'll just say direction to it. Is that, is that kind of what I'm hearing? No, this, what I'm saying is that okay. this second tuition policy the yes, one sir. That, that provides for admission on tuition basis mm -hmm. as a board discretion without having to review and redo policies. It doesn't mean we have to. Right. So Simon, in this sentence here, tuition rate shall be determined annually. The if we had a line after that that said the board shall the board shall uh, determine to ex or shall vote on accepting tuition students for the next school year by March 31st. There's something in there about May 31st on this one. Let me look. If you go after section five, second paragraph below that is that it's a, this is evaluated on an annual basis and expires. Uh, and so to me. This is the preferred policy, but if we're going to go on a policy that says we're not permitting admission, this it kind of defeats the purpose of what this has been drafted at. Now, now if we're saying March 31st is the date we want and we want to merge that into rather than May 31st, I'm okay with that. But I feel that this, this is the policy we need to be approving, if not just merging it to change the deadlines. Okay. Um, but I feel that the other one that was first included in the agenda precludes the opportunity to admit tuition students without us having to revise that. And depending on when, when that school board makes that determination, if they ever do it, this option and this policy that was proposed and never adopted and never part of a policies may not be part of the institutional memory. And so we're gonna have to do this all over again. So when it says guidelines, are those administrative guidelines and that's the other part of this, or is this just an explanation of the, uh, the upper portion? The, the way I read these, there's two separate policies and adopting one precludes the adoption of the other. Yeah, I, I would agree, but yeah, even that's how I uh, read it. Notice that at the top, it has the policy, then it has this subheading that says guidelines. Isn't that the I hear guidelines yes. are those and are those. I see what you're saying, Dr. Kump. So Dr. Kump, I think I see what you're saying. So you're saying the guidelines go on both, right? Well, no, what I'm just saying is, is this. A He's thing wondering if it's guidelines that are not in the board policy. It's under guidelines in right. board docs. That's what I want to know. That is not what this is. This is guidelines on how we will accept these students. Huh. Well, so the, the top of that, yeah, that's a good question, Doc. I don't know that the top of that document, though, refers to it as the policy manual, refers to it as a PO with a blank space right. number. And so the inference I made on that is that this is part of our policy. Correct. It's policy. Yeah. So even when it says guidelines, it's actually policy. Well, I, it depends on what was intended Yeah. by, by Helen here, but... Um, 
I would rather we use the word procedures because that's what it is. It's the steps of how you implement a policy. Yeah, I think we need to, I would suggest we table this to discuss it with Helen and as a board to ensure that we're trying to, that we understand what this is supposed to represent. If, I mean, we can't understand whether it's a guideline or procedural at this point, there's doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I don't feel that confused about it, to be honest with you. I thought that the guidelines are if you're moving forward with accepting tuition, and then the other option is non-admission. Hey, do you have any clarification on conversations that you had with Helen regarding this? I didn't have any. This was not my. OK, opinion. yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't know if you did or didn't. I wasn't trying. I, I, I will give you my opinion on this. I believe this policy right here that says that the board may permit the admission. If you have this document in our policy, then all we have to do on an annual basis is decide whether or not to have tuition students, just like we do with open enrollment. Okay. And that way this is not, I mean, somebody would have to go on our website and put down for tuition. If we decide not to do it, Tip City Schools is not accepting tuition students based on the board resolution on this date. And so then you're not changing the policy every year. Right. You're just putting it on our website. Like I know that you had said that, Teresa, if a new family okay. on, they want to, moves in, they want to know if they can do tuition or not. Correct. If it's on our website that says we are not accepting tuition students for 2021, Gotcha. Your answer. And then say in, in March of 2021, we decide we're going to accept them for 21, 22. Then we just say tip city schools is now accepting tuition for 21, 22. Right. And I think we're all trying, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, which we're trying to get a policy in place. We're trying to make it easy for future boards families, students, staff, administrators, whoever, to, to be able to have a policy to refer to. And I mean, we have all been completely overwhelmed with a lot of, you know, emails and information. And um, I, I think we're all trying to achieve the same thing. I mean, I don't think anybody's, we're all just kind of reading it different or seeing it different. Um, so let me just read this real quick. And, and here's the other thing though, is it says that if we use March 31st, uh -huh. It says that applications are due by April 1st. <laughs> okay. Wait, can you scroll back up? Where's that? So right here. Number four. Number four. Okay, let me, gotcha. Yeah, I gotcha. Must make a, it's by April 1st. I don't think this one says March 31st in it anywhere, Dave. No, it doesn't. It, it says May 31st for the upcoming school year. So the way it's designed, if you, the way it's written works, it's that unless you, you renew it on May 31st for the upcoming school year, then it expires. So you would, so this right now, we would be revisiting it for 2021 by May 31st. Yes, but that means applications have to be in by April 1st. That's one day. No, no it, applications are due on April 1st and you have until May 31st. Okay. So that's like two months, basically. So in my mind, if the board just voted to not have tuition students, we have voted on, on not having tuition students. Right. We just don't have the policy that tells us how to go through our procedures. Right. Yeah, I think I think I see what you're saying, Dave. It, this doesn't. We'd have to have the vote on this earlier in the year. That way, people aren't sending applications in for no reason. Right. Right. That's kind of what I'm trying to establish is the timeline. So, Dr. Kump, when do we normally tell people to have their applications in by for tuition? So I think it. Oh, I'm have to. I don't have the application in front of me right now, but uh, I believe that. It's like April through May 1st, something well, of that nature. Oh, so you're saying just a month, April 1st to May 1st? We only give them a month? Because I think we tell them and get their letters out by about June 1st. Wow, okay. I, I believe that's right. That's a pretty small window. 
It is. 30 days. Mr. Veerhoff, do you have a recollection on that? I just do not have that form in front of me. I do not, okay. unfortunately. I can tell you who can tell me. Give me a sec. I'll call Carrie. Well, Carrie sent it to us a couple of weeks ago in a Friday board update. It's at the very top of the application form. Well, it's already 9.05. Do we want to just table this and, and get with Helen? Well, I I'm to trying to accomplish and achieve the same thing. We just want to do the right thing, put a policy in place, and, and you know, not handcuff future boards to always do the right thing for students. So in the respect of it, all we're already being 9.05 and we still have executive session, is everybody okay with me reaching out to Helen on this particular policy and seeing what changes she recommends? And then I'll just add, and we need just our dates to align. Right, yeah, exactly, that's my point. So Mrs. Prawl believes that it is open from April 1st to June 1st. Oh, oh okay, that's a big difference, okay. okay. Check and confirm with me. But that's a big difference, that, okay. We can always change that to what we feel is necessary. So I'm confused. We just voted on that motion to not accept any tuition students for Correct. 2021. Correct? Yes, yes. ma'am. So what is all this dialogue about now? I'm sorry. <laughs> A policy in the future that, like Simon pointed out, would um, not inhibit a board from deciding to admit tuition students. Right, Simon? Is that my getting that right? That's correct. So it just so just to be clear, the the policy it has been voted by this board tonight to not accept any tuition student applications for 2021, is that a correct statement? Correct, that's correct. Okay, so all this discussion now is moving forward and can this, is there, a, is there a, uh, an imminent timeline that we have to meet to have this discussion? Well, we currently don't have a policy. That's kind of what I was There's, yeah. to indicate when we were taking the vote on that is that we didn't yet have a policy really permitting or, or permitting us to either approve or deny tuition students. Which is, that was sent to us by then, council, correct? Am I? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, she I'm just sent that to everybody, correct? So, so but like the I dates saying, on it don't match up right. No, what I was saying, we sh should not have, in my opinion, voted on that earlier. It's okay that we have, but we still need to. We still need a policy that addresses that. Our council provided two policies. One which provides us the discretion to do it on an annual basis, and then provides a guideline for if we do permit it. So if we approve that one, the vote that we took earlier today would simply just stand the way it is under this policy. And for the 2021 school year, there would be no tuition students, but the policy would be in place so that from year to year, if this board ever changed its mind, that they could change to admit tuition students. And that policy would already be in there as prepared by our legal counsel. And so if we're no longer on the board and there's no there's no longer institutional memory related to this policy that may or may not have been adopted, then it's in the book if it was rather. If it wasn't, it may not be known to us. So my but suggestion so in, in the interest of action. Of, and but in the interest of the here and now, can we move that to maybe a work session topic? Well, that's what I'm saying. Let's just send it to Helena and get the dates more accurate. You know, because it that's is why nine o'clock. I That's why I moved to table it. I did too. And save the dialogue and the debate yeah. for, for another It's already time. 10 after 9. I just say table it. We'll have Helen look at it. We'll match it up with our open enrollment form to make sure that either Carrie's correct or Dr. Comp's correct. It's, it's April 1st through May 15th. Carrie got back to me by text. Okay. So six weeks. So May 31st would be accurate. What Helen has is accurate. If it's May 15th and we're May 31st, that's two weeks. That's so again, appropriate. oh my gosh. I will, I will work with Helen on this. Yeah, let's do that. It's, it's late and we still have executive session. Thank you. Do we have a motion to table or do we need that? 
Uh, Simon, well, both motion and second. Uh, Patry Dunaway, motion and second. Well, yes, are we tabling both of them then? Yes. Y yes, let's just table them both and have Helen look at it. So we're not going to discuss vacations or holidays either? I, I don't know. Are we going to? It's on there. I mean, that's another policy that we need to get done before July 1st. So we already have it. So let's look at it. Go ahead, Dave. Okay. Well, this is the policy that Helen worked up based on, uh, let me put it on the screen, based on what we have discussed in our previous meetings. Um, policy. Okay. So did it just change for you? No. No, no it's still on um, cushion. Got to pick the right one. All right. How about now? Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> so based on what Helen received in our discussions, we've currently adjusted the vacation and holidays for support staff. This is non-teaching employees. We reduced the 10 days, 15 days, and 20 days to follow a five-year schedule for having two weeks of vacation. If you if you work between five and ten, you get fifth, three weeks of day, three three days. I'm saying this three weeks of vacation, and anything over ten years of service, you get four weeks of vacation. What we've discussed in the past. Um, now, Helen included anybody that has been hired before July 1st of 2020. They may carry over a maximum of five vacation days from one year to the next. <clears throat> All vacation days will be forfeited as of July 31st of each contract year. However, we also have the stipulation where it gives you three years to get your balance down from 60 days at the most 60 days down to five days by the end of July 31st, 2023. This is what I believe we had discussed previously as well. And there's this item, if, I'll come back. If you were hired after, on or after July 1st, 2020, you just get, you carry over five days from one year to the next, all other vacation days are forfeited. Um, the, the superintendent will have final approval of vacation schedule. And for all support staff hired after July 2020, when you separate, you follow the current state statute, which is looking back two years, any earned but unused vacation, you would be paid out. And in your current final year, any earned but unused vacation would be paid out. Based on how this is set up, you can't have more than five days carry over from one year to the next. So the most you would be looking at is five days from the previous two years, plus whatever they've earned and not used in the last year. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Makes sense, Dave. This is where it differs between version one and version two. Um, she includes paying out. I'm not sure if the board had said they were looking for them to have school days paid out during that three years of trying to get the balances down. This right here allows someone to have over those three years paid 30 days total, 10 in each year, the vacation payout. The rest of their days, they have to use them. And if they don't use them, they lose them by July 31st of 2023. I said that wrong. July 1st.
Correct. Until no, it's July 31st. I was in, it is July 31st. So this reduces the vacation payout upon separation from the district, but this still includes payment of 10 days a year to help them get their vacation down. Or you'll have people using 40 days a year to get their balance down. Um, it also calls out for if someone were to leave before July 1st of 2023, they just get paid out per statute. Whatever was earned but unused the previous two years and then the current year. So this is the first version. The second version Oh, where did you go? Dave, may I ask you a quick question? Is this time sensitive, this policy? It has to be approved by July 1st. Yeah, okay. July 1. I just feel it's such an important topic and we have digressed, if you will, or spent a lot, and my brain is getting a little bit foggy, and I don't want, I want to be able to give my greatest clarity to this vacation holiday, because right. it's such an important topic. Then, I then, agree. Then, then here's my suggestion. It's detailed, and I want to make sure I'm absorbing the details, and after three hours and 17 minutes, and an it's executive ridiculous. session to go, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give it my best at this right. point. So, so here's my recommendation. I'd like the we will move on. I'd like the board members to review both versions, put down your notes, and we can meet together in a work session or an executive se a, a work session or a special meeting or something. Go through the notes, figure out what we like, and we can use our policy, basing it off. We can create a policy basing it off of what Helen has provided to us. I mean, she has given us the skeleton the, the, to have a policy. We just have to figure out what numbers we like best and which numbers we don't. Yes. So, all right. So neither one of these policies are going to so Dave, can you give us a, a deadline for when you want the board members to get that information back to you so that we stay on track? I would say give it to me by next Friday. Next Friday is, let me, we need to do it by July 1st. Okay. No, no, no. July. Be like the 20th, Friday is thirtieth, wouldn't it? No, no. He we need to get it done by July first. So you want all of our information to you by May 29th? Is that right? Yeah, because we're not going to have a special meet. You've already got a, a special meeting on the twenty seventh. Correct. We don't have anything until after June first? So I'd say just give me what you've got on on May 29th. Procedurally, I got a couple of things. The first is that we have to have this read twice before July 1st, 2020 to have it approved. The second reading, correct? Well, I can, I'll can. i check with Helen again. She made it sound like having two reads was a courtesy. And there could be situations where you don't have to have two reads. I will confirm that with her just to confirm what that procedure would be then to only do one read and then approve it. Wouldn't you be checking that with Neola? I would rather have an attorney opinion on that. Okay. But I liked your initial concept, Dave. We kind of get together, put our heads together with a you know, a clear mind and, and discuss this yeah. uh, as a group rather than piecemealing me sending something because that way we're all hearing the same information at the same time. And, and well, I would, I would still like your ideas. That way I can put something together that helps us organize in an organized fashion, go through what we're all thinking and figure out what works best. 
I don't think that's a bad idea, but I think we got to make sure that Dave, that stays with you until it's presented at the work session. That is correct. It only comes to me. Okay, so what work session are we talking about? We don't have a date yet. Uh, let me look for June. We do have one already on the books, June 16. Yeah, June 16th, Dave. So if, if I mean, we can have our get together at that time. Uh, I'll have to check with Helen to see if we can do our meeting, figure out what we want, and then have a first read after I have built that policy that night. Or if we can forego two reads, we can fix it that night and then approve it at our June, what is that, 24th meeting? I don't know what the date is for that meeting. Um, yeah, June 22nd. June 29. Okay. No, the board meeting is June 22nd. The work session is the 16th. Oh, that's right. Okay. What's the 22nd? The, the board meeting is the 22nd and the work session is the 16th. Yeah, so I will check with Helen and make sure we could do just a single read before approval. Okay. If not, I'll ask her what we need to do to get it done. Okay, thank yeah. you. So for this one, there was no motion or anything. We just... I will note that we did not have a first read. Yeah, great. And then are we going to have adequate time at that June 16 work session? I don't know what's already on the plate for it. So again, I, I, I feel this is a topic that, you know, we need to be dedicated. With oh yeah, I, it should not be done at the end of a three and a half hour meeting. I agree. Right. Three and a half hour meetings to me are, that's it. Like we cannot have these six hour meetings and, and be dealing with very important information at the end of a, it just does it's not effective. It's not good. So are we going to have enough time at anticipating the June 16 work session? Are we going to have enough leeway there to, to weave this into it? I don't know what's on. I don't know if I don't have, think we have anything on it yet. So let's just I mean, this should be our main thing, correct? I believe okay. that was one of the extra meetings that we established at the beginning of the year. Yeah, well, well, look how smart we are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Miss President. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, policies were not established as additional questions were had by the board and additional attorney review is, was desired. No first reads occurred this evening. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so now we have a motion to adjourn to executive session. Hang on for a second. My computer always zaps out. I'm sorry. I don't know why my, my Chromebook does not stay connected. Give me one second. It's the goofiest thing. Hang on, trying to reboot here. Oh, okay, gotcha. Motion to adjourn to executive session for purposes authorized under Board of Education Policy 0166 and ORC 121.22G1 to consider the employment and compensation of a public employee or official. And I do believe that the board will be inviting both Dr. Kumpf and Mr. Stevens into executive session. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Can I get a motion in a second? A motion. Motion by Corinne, seconded by Dunaway. Okay. Teresa, yeah, never mind. Uh, Dahl. Yes. Dunaway. Yes. Heatherly. Yes. Patry. Yes. Four. Yes. Teresa. So I believe. I right. believe that Corinne sent a link out earlier for the executive session. Does anybody need a five minute break or are we just gonna jump right on? I need I'm good to minutes. go. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dr. Kumpf, go ahead. I would like to have three minutes, please. I sure. would too, thank you. Yeah, just take everyone, just do, just do five minutes and we'll jump on the executive session at 9.30, is that good? Okay. Yes. Uh, right. Teresa. Oh, there's, sorry. There's no anticipated action. Oh, in this. Correct. correct. Yes, no anticipated action. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yep, we good? Yep, you can take off. Okay, thank you.
Sometimes I forget to turn my camera on. <laughs> oh my gosh. I couldn't get out of that other meeting. I felt like I was hostage. I, I didn't know how to exit out of it. That's horrible. Oh, I, I was trying to tell you the little red telephone at the bottom, but I think it must've cut off. Oh my gosh. I don't know what took me so long. I'm like logging in, logging in. Sorry about that. And Teresa, <laughs> you're in here for 500 minutes. <laughs> heck is going on i'm so annoyed i know i couldn't i was like kidnapped i'm like waiting waiting it's clicking around okay are we ready we don't have joellen yet i don't know where she's oh at. well good i wasn't last i maybe she maybe had the same problem as me i could not log in it was just spinning there she is she's coming oh good no offense but i'm glad i wasn't last i felt terrible okay Joellen, are you able to hear us? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. I think we're all <laughs> ready to go. You. Can you okay. hear me now? Motion. Then we got to yes. back into a regular session. Okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? No, hold on a sec. We declare us oh, back into a regular session at 1022. Whew. One you more time, to, Dave. You have to declare us back into regular session at 1022. Okay. So we are now back in regular session at 1022, and I would like to get a motion to adjourn. I motion. Second. Motion by Dow, second by Zakor. Oh. Ready for roll? Yes. Zakor. Yes. Dunaway. Yes. Beverly. Yes. Patrick. Yes. Motion carries, meeting adjourned. At 1022 p.m. Good night. 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 Good night, everyone. Rest well. <laughs> yeah. No.